is uh, being done. Apologies. This meeting, Apologies. This meeting is, done, is being done via Zoom. If you would like to join us, uh, you can go to the town website and click on the agenda for tonight, and it will give you instructions as to how to participate via Zoom. Uh, we're holding this meeting remotely in uh, accordance with Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency. I think it was nearly two years ago. Um, the meeting will also be recorded and can be viewed on Situate Community Television Facebook Live. Uh, the meeting, the recording, the recorded meeting will be available the following day on Comcast Channel 9 and YouTube Situate Community Television. So do I hear a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. Moved. moved by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Vignani. All in favor, we need to do roll call votes because we're remote. Yes, Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. The agenda is accepted. Um, do I see any walk-ins? I see uh, Bill Brokamp has his hand up. Uh, Mr. Brokamp, if you're here about the West End um, truck, tr truck traffic, that is on our agenda. Um, so if you could wait until that part of the discussion to ask any questions, unless you have something to say that's not related to that. We're save, we save walk-ins for those people who would like to ask a question or make a comment about something that is not on the agenda. Okay? I, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that I had my hand up, but I'm, I'm well, just going to <laughs> Thanks. So, Pam, Abitabli, did you have something to say? You have a hand up too. I'm sorry, Ms. Conley, are you seeing a hand raise? I'm not seeing a hand raise. That's- um, I am. You are, you are, okay. Um, it, it seems like maybe they're doing it unintentionally. Right now, there are no hand raised. I can tell you that much from my, my perspective. Well, on my screen, it's Pam has got her hand raised, which is why I'm saying it's probably not right. All right, we'll just move on. Uh, could we have the report of the town administrator, Jim Boudreau, please? Well, good evening. Uh, we'll start with our COVID update. Uh, it's the same one I gave this morning, so I'm sorry if someone saw this and I'm repeating myself. Uh, the COVID cases on our MAVEN data, and again, the MAVEN is the reported numbers that are reported by doctors and registered testing sites. It was 110. That was up from 104 of last week. The total number of cases reported to the Board of Health for the last two weeks was 494. Uh, that's up from the 300 plus of last week. So those numbers continue to trend up. And in terms of our positivity rating over the last four days, it was up to 20.66, which is up from 14.48 of last week. Plymouth County is up to 24.13 from 17.41. However, the state's positivity rating uh, has gone down to 19.9 from 23.02. So the local numbers are up, but the state numbers are down. Uh, that's consistent with what we're seeing. We are being told that we might be reaching the peak. The good numbers and the hope that we're getting is that the Omicron and the COVID variants that are tested in the wastewater at Deer Island have taken a precipitous drop since the beginning of January. Uh, the Southern waste stream, the levels have dropped 55% since the beginning of January and the Northern waste stream has dropped 65% since the beginning of January. Uh, experts have used that as kind of a predictor of where COVID is going. So we're hoping that continues. They took large jumps in December as the numbers started going up. So we're hoping that this means uh, that we are getting past the peak and things will get better. However, uh, we do remind people the vaccines are very good at keeping you safe from getting very sick or getting hospitalized if you do get COVID. Uh, if you are eligible, please get a vaccine. If you're eligible for your booster, please get your booster. Right now, Marshfield Fairgrounds is taking drive-ins. Uh, they prefer appointments. But you can drive in if they have a slot available, you'll be able to get your booster right away. Uh, anyone 11 and over can get the Pfizer vaccine five months after your second shot. Anyone 18 and older can get the Moderna six months after your second shot. And anyone 18 or older can get the Johnson & Johnson two months after your single dose Johnson & Johnson. So hopefully we are getting to the other side of this, uh, but we'll see as the weeks go forward. Hospitalizations are still high. Hospitals are still overcrowded, so we'll, uh, we'll see if those numbers start to trend down over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the question we keep getting, and I'll repeat again, why Situate does not have a mask mandate. 
Uh, the town has repeatedly said that we will follow the directions of the state and the mandates as posted by the state. Right now, the state has a mask recommendation for any public indoor spaces. We have posted all our buildings to that effect that it is recommended that you wear a mask. However, we have not put in a mask mandate. Uh, and for right now, we will not do so unless the state reimposes that mask mandate. Uh, last week, we auctioned off the property of Tilden Road, number one Tilden Road. This is a house that had been closed down. It was in disrepair. It had no septic system. The town had taken that property for tax title. Uh, we received a bid of $200,000 for that property, which we think is pretty good. That money will go to the general fund and eventually we'll wash the free cash at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, Widow's Walk Clubhouse, we are still doing the renovations. They're still working on the floor in the main room. Uh, unfortunately, the bid deadline for operators of the concession was due today. Uh, we did not receive any bids prior to the deadline. Uh, what we'll do at this point now is we will reach out to some of the vendors who had expressed interest in the bid uh, and try to find out why they didn't bid, whether it was something in the bid specs or the bid docs that kept them away. Uh, or whether it was just really kind of COVID related that either they didn't have the staff to prepare the bid, they don't think they'll have the staff to actually operate the facility, or they're concerned about opening a new restaurant facility in the midst of COVID. Um, so we'll reach out, we'll find out what the issues were, and then as quickly as possible, if we have to, we'll make changes to the bid and put it back out. Uh, we don't think it had anything to do with the bid price. The monthly rate was less than $3,000 a month. Uh, for a space like that, that is really extremely cheap. Uh, so again, we'll reach out to some of the vendors, see what we get, and then Nancy and I will make changes if we have to the RFP and get it back out and see what we get back in. Uh, related to Widow's Walk also, golf season's over, walking's allowed. You're allowed to walk your dogs up there. We just ask you please keep off the greens and out of the sand traps, keep the course in good shape and pick up after your dog. We have barrels all around the course. So um, I think one thing that drives me crazy is when people bend over, pick up the, the dog's waist, put it in the plastic bag, tie the plastic bag, and then leave the plastic bag next to the path. Uh, it just makes all sense. So please pick it up, put it in the trash, and we'll get it. Uh, finally, I emailed the board this last week as an FYI, but we asked Sat to announce that after 33 years of service, uh, Deputy Chief Al Elliott has decided that he will be retiring. February 22nd of this year will be Al's last shift. Uh, I know we'll be doing something for Al. We'll have him into the board, but uh, just to let people know that Al's going to be going. If you see him, please stop by. Say thank you for 33 years of really dedicated service to the Situate Fire Department, the residents of Situate. Uh, as I said, we'll have him in, but uh, we want to let people know so that they will have the opportunity uh, to thank Al for his service before he goes on the 22nd. And that's what I have for this evening. Very good. Questions from the board? No. I'll just say publicly, uh, you know, I know I speak for the board that um, you know, we, we wish Al his, uh, a happy retirement. He's been a, a consummate professional and been a great service to the community for all the years. So uh, we're sad to see him go, but happy to see him uh, retiring um, happily. So Al, thank you for all your service. Thank you, Al. Um, Jim, just one question about the widow's walk. Did the potential um, bidders get a chance to actually tour the facility? Yes. Okay. We only had one take advantage of it. Okay. All right. That was my only question. All right. Shall we move on um, to the scheduled items, the 645 update? This is simply an update. We did have a, um, a citizens group uh, sent, signed a petition asking us to look into uh, the possibility of dealing with the large um, trucks that seem to find their way through the West End roads that are very narrow, windy, um, they take islands out, they, they do damage. Um, so at the last meeting or the meeting before, we asked if uh, the fire chief, I mean the police chief Thompson and Kevin Cafferty, DPW director could take a look at the issue. And that's, we're simply discussing it tonight we won't be taking any action, but trying to flesh out, you know, what's going on out there and what potential there is for helping out the, what is a difficult situation for some people. So I think I do see the chief and I do see Kevin Cafferty. So I don't know who would like to start, but feel free gentlemen. Um, I'll start it up if that's okay. That's um, fine. 
first of all, when after the select board meeting, I met up with Mark, Sean McCarthy, as well as Taylor, the traffic engineer, and we had a discussion about this um, issue. Um, the petition says for anybody that's not familiar with it to the idea is to prohibit truck traffic over two and a half tons from utilizing the West End as a shortcut to and from the highway. The situate, the intersection of most concerning is Clap Road, Gro Clap Road Grove Street, Manlot 3A and Booth Hill and 3A. So I reached out to um, one of the signers who had called me earlier today and we had a little talk about it. And my question is exactly what we're looking to accomplish with this. And we've also done a little um, research on it. So I had reached out to a traffic engineer. So this would be, if we did change this, it would be a change from an HCV, which is a heavy commercial vehicle exclusion zone. Um, we would have to go through mass start with that. So there's certain criteria that it has to meet through the MUTCD manual and uniform traffic control devices guidelines to be met. Um, couple of the issues is the truck volume um, five to eight percent in that general vicinity. Um, is the pavement condition, is it designed for heavy use, which it is, it's a standard um, town road. And if there's residential land use in the area, there's the potential of granting evening hours that you could ban the trucks from going across there. Um, the vehicles that have business in the area will still use the roads, such as landscape, um, contractors, Amazon, Honstra trucks. Um, so they still have full use of it. So the first step in order for us to accomplish a heavy um, commercial vehicle exclusion zone would be to do a pretty intensive traffic study. So we would be looking at costs of about $50,000. Um, the study would have to be submitted to MassDOT for approval and justification. And if we were rerouting traffic to or from Norwell or Cohasset, we would have to have their approvals also. Um, one of the other concerns that I heard from a couple of the residents were that there's a lot of pedestrian use on these roads. Unfortunately, the roads were not designed for pedestrians. That would be something that would be with us that we would possibly have to do sidewalks if that was the case in the future. Um, so that being said, it would be a while. This wouldn't be something that could happen immediately. We'd have to budget the $50,000 and then go forward with it. So um, in my mind, I'd like to talk to the residents who were involved in this at some point and maybe get a feeling for what they're looking for. Is there another way we could accomplish it and how we could make things work for them or accomplish what they're looking for? Um, if it is just doing the HCV, it's it's something we'd work with and, and look forward to. And um, I also want to bring up Mark. Mark had a couple of comments, and I, I don't want to steal all this thunder. Oh, th thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, I, I think what Kevin's hitting on is definitely the concerns for how the groundwork could be laid to be moved forward with something like this. Um, I know that there was some discussion brought up about other communities and, and what they've done there too. I think we have a, a really pretty distinct challenge with the West End in that we have these roadways that are interconnecting smaller neighborhoods and other smaller roadways, as opposed to two roads with a connector in between. So when we start to look at restricting some of that traffic, we have to look at what's gonna to happen to that traffic um, and where are we pushing it to? So we wanna make sure that if we're making restriction in one place, we're not pushing the problem somewhere else. Um, and again, that comes down to not only the traffic, but then how is the traffic gonna operate on the roadway? Are there proper turning radiuses? Are there other things that we're looking at? Um, one of the other things is we have two locations in town that do have the restriction, Man Lot and Booth Hill on the east side. And in both of those cases, it references a 10 ton restriction, um, which is speaking to gross vehicle weight. Uh, this petition as was written, talks about a two and a half ton weight restriction, uh, which would really be referring to the payload. So enforcement would certainly be a challenge with this um, because as Kevin alluded to, people in you know, commercial carriers who have legitimate business in the area, we're gonna be traveling that road. Uh, but when we look at, hey, is this vehicle potentially outside of what this restriction is? If we're looking at payload, 
a, you know, an F-550, a typical six wheel dump truck may be completely fine with no load in it, but as soon as it's carrying something would be over the weight limit. Um, so if we're gonna be looking at some type of an exclusion, we wanna be careful about what that looks like. So if we're going to take some type of enforcement, we're giving realistic expectations for both the carriers and for the officers that would have to do the enforcement. Um, so those were really a couple of the concerns that come up. And I think one of the other things that we talk about when we're looking at the volume that's going on the road, um, with all the major construction projects that are happening in town, the planning board is putting restrictions in place for the operators and for the contractors who are working there. And while it's not necessarily perfect because you have subcontractors that are maybe outside of what the purview is or you know deliveries that are coming in, uh, by and large, they're following the trucking groups that are established in conjunction with the planning board and the police department. So when these major construction projects are happening in town, we're really working to ensure that the smaller residential roads are not being impacted with the burden of heavy trucks. Um, and as I said, it's, it's not perfect but there are a lot of efforts that are made to make sure that we're careful about where those trucks are going. So I think that that's something that we need to continue to do going forward as well. Well, if I may, Maura, you had offered to be the liaison to this particular group um, and you've had a lot of experience uh, with trucks in the West End because of your location. So maybe you could, you know, if you have any questions, I'd, if I could start with you. Yeah, I mean, I offered to be, thank you, the liaison, but I haven't spoken with anybody further. So this is, <clears throat> I don't really have any update with regards to representing what their needs are, but certainly happy to take that on. You know, Kevin, when you, you know, do reach out with the residents, I'm happy to be there. I, I don't know, like I would have to defer to Bill. I mean, for me, it's the 18 wheelers. So maybe it's that 10 ton limit, uh, you know, that Mark was just re alluding to that exists over on the other side of 3A on some of those roads, um, but I'll defer to the residents. I don't really have a lot to add because I haven't spoken with any of them. Well, I guess I could, if I could ask a question, are, do you, and I think there are residents on, um, are you referring to simply the big construction vehicles or are you also including things like the giant um, trucks that deliver groceries and beer and, soft drinks and because those can be very big vehicles so I, I don't know if it's if it's construction that should only be temporary you know depending on the size of the development but the other types of trucks are constant if they're using those roads and I, I don't know does anybody know no are you asking the residents that are on Karen or well, I'm asking anyone who's that? willing to chime in oh does Mr. Brokamp have something to say? I see his name. If an individual has something to say, they would need to raise their hand at this point. Okay. Can I ask Mark a question? Please. Really? Mark, did you guys look and see where you thought the traffic would flow into if we did restrict those areas? Well, I think that that becomes one of the challenges when you start to look at things. I mean, Kevin brought up the fact that we're dealing with Norwell and Cohasset as well. So if you look at vehicles that are coming from the west, if you have somebody who's come down Grove Street, for example, in Norwell, cuts down Mount Blue and now arrives on the clap, you know, the first question is, are we going to allow them on the clap? Now that we have, what are we going to do with them? So we're, we're pushing them either continuing down clap and you know, you see what I mean? Like you start to yeah. look at these things um, and similarly go in the other direction. If you're on 3A, easy enough, I guess, to say, hey, we'll put signs 3A at Booth Hill and Man Lot to restrict the traffic heading westbound. Um, but then again, if I'm trying to get to Grove Street or something on Clap or Tanglewood, I'm now got to go further up to First Parish and now come up to the intersection at Grove and try to make that corner and move that way. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I guess the intent is if you're coming in and out of town with commerce, I think in a lot of cases, those large trucks, that's not gonna be their preference for how they're gonna to wanna to travel anyways. They would look to travel on 123 or 228, depending on which direction they're coming down from. Um, but other cases, if you've got Jordan's Furniture that's coming to do a delivery with a large truck, they're going to a resident most likely. Um, and then sometimes you get stuck if I haven't headed up to Colonial or Vernon or something, how are you coming in and getting at that, that smaller roadway? Um, and I think that that's where some of those questions and challenges come up in terms of if we've got a truck on, on the road, what's their, what's their end game? Are they traversing to you know, get to a business down the harbor? Um, and that's something that, yeah, maybe that's not the best way to go. 
uh, but otherwise are they most likely making delivery onto some of those smaller interconnecting roads inside. Right, and, it, and my, my thought was, you know, I think you alluded to, those big trucks don't wanna drive on those roads anyways. I mean, it's, it's dangerous to drive, but is it a speed limit thing? You know, what, what are the residents, you know, as Morris said, we haven't really spoken of the residents to find right. out what the issue is, but do we drop the speed limit on some of those streets to, to accommodate some of their concerns as well? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in some of those roadways too, you're either gonna have thickly settled or, or they're posted at 30. Um, but on some of those roads, you get into turning radiuses, you get into just, you know, tight, smaller roadway, um, but you also run into overhangs. Um, with, you know, what's that tree canopy look like? So you'll have trucks or a cement truck that's going through and that's not necessarily where they're gonna to wanna to go because with the roadway being narrow and a lower canopy, they're most likely hitting the top of the truck as they're going by things. Um, so, you know, ho hopefully it's not necessarily just the GPS has sent them a certain way. And I think sometimes you might see that too. Um, and that might be a problem. All right. Yes, Maura? Can I ask a follow-up? Um, so Mark, to that point, should, be, should we be working with Norwell and Cohasset, you know, to your point, right? You got to restrict them at the, the entrance of those roads coming all the way through the West End. So either they're all going down 123 or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. So would a next step, would it make more sense to start this process with those two towns as partners? I mean, I think that there's a conversation to be had maybe with both of those towns and see if they're hearing similar things. I mean, you know, I, I think of Grove Street and Old Oak and Bucket coming in from, from Norwell. Are they hearing mm -hmm. similar complaints um, or is the traffic really being you know, limited on 123? Um, and from the Cohasset side, obviously Beechwood and coming up through that area. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the ballpark up there. But again, there's tight turns there coming off of Beechwood to try to make your way up on the summer. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of larger trucks would have a problem with that. Yep, agreed. Well, I do see Mr. Brokamp has his hand up, and if he, you could unmute yourself. I've asked like Mr. Bro. He should be Mr. Good. Brokamp. Yeah. Hi. hi. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what I can offer other than um, I see other towns have been able to accomplish this with a two and a half ton limit. I uh, I have a game camera set up. If anybody's interested, I can start showing you some of the examples of um, trucks that I feel are entirely inappropriate, particularly since most of them roll through uh, from Norwell past the, the old situate dump. I, there's no way that that road was built to accommodate these things. You, you take, a, take an F-350 with, a, with a, uh, a landscaper's trailer on the back, it, it's a monster. And so that, that's why I would continue to recommend that somebody look into two and a half tons rather than a 10 ton limit. It's not just the semi trailers. They're large delivery trucks that are just entirely inappropriate. And they blow in through here as fast as they can go. That's all I can offer. All right. I'm happy to meet, talk, do anything to help, but I, I'm kind of limited in what I can offer. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Conley, you do have another hand raised. It's from uh, Emily Matthews. Oh, I, I can sort of see the hand. Emily Matthews, if you could tell us your address, please. Hi, Emily Matthews, 158 Clap Road. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for, for taking me. I, um, I like Bill, am uh, supportive of, of these, uh, of taking some measures to, to see what we can do to keep our country roads, country roads um, and safe for all of us that are on them as residents. Um, I had a great conversation today with Kevin on the phone. I just wanna thank him for taking his time to um, thoughtfully speak to me and, and educate me. And um, as a resident who doesn't do much um, in town government, I, uh, I am really interested in um, working to find creative solutions. Um, maybe if uh, reducing from 10 to two and a half tons isn't a realistic solution for our roads, um, like Bill, what else can we do? And I'm invested in, um, no, in working toward that to come up with some of those solutions and, and things outside of the box that might make um, that might make our roads less desirable to big trucks um, and just safer overall. 
All right. And then Mr. Brokamp, could you give us your address? And, and if you could uh, call Town Hall with your contact information, uh, none of us seem to have a phone number or an email to reach you. So that would be helpful. Uh, okay. Oh, you sound skeptical. <laughs> no, no, I'm just fooling around. I didn't mute, unmute. I'm just working <laughs> with that. No, no, that's not a problem at all. Yeah. Okay, good, um, good. Yeah, we just like to keep you in the loop. So just something to the select board in general? Yes, that's just a, call town hall, call the selectman's office, select board office, and give okay. them your, your uh, contact information. Okay. You can talk to Lorraine Devon. All right. I'll Thank you. In the morning. Thank All right, you. great. Thank you. Anyone else? I just, I don't want anybody to think that we're just saying no to this. I think we just want the residents to know that it's not as easy as the board voting to say we're going to have a truck ban. Uh, because it intersects with multiple communities, because it intersects with Route 3A, there's multiple, multiple hoops uh, that have to be jumped through. We did, we did it on uh, Bridge Street when I was in Norwell. Uh, because of the bridge, we put a weight restriction there. But it was a long time. And as uh, Mark, both Mark and Kevin said, the starting point is the data. Uh, and you have to do the truck counts, find out where the trucks are. And really, the key is, once you get all that information, is trying to figure out where these vehicles are going to go. Uh, and, right. and then once you do that, uh, the board will then start hearing from the residents of those roads that are going to find out, well, wait a second, you're going to put those trucks on, on my neighborhood. I think a lot of the problem is, is as Chief Thompson said, uh, it's the new GPS. It's people's GPS saying, go down this way, go down this way, go down this way, and taking them through every little neighborhood and nook and cranny. Uh, but it is a process and, and we're willing to work through it, but people are going to have to be patient because it will take a little while anytime you're dealing with mass DOT. So I guess my question to Kevin would be the $50,000 for a traffic study, would that be for the entire West End or only for certain intersections? I'm not clear on that. Well, that would be for the entire West End and okay. we could change it up accordingly. I just asked them to get me budget numbers of what it would take to... Um, complete what was spelled out in the, uh, the petition. All right, thank you. Anyone else, Maura? I have one last question, Karen, and it's not, it's related, but not directly. Um, and Tony, maybe you re recall this. A couple of years ago, we had residents come in and request, what is it, a town-wide, wasn't it a 25 mile an hour speed limit? Have we gone, gone around and installed those signs because I was curious, I, I haven't personally seen them. So I was just curious what our determination was there and whether that was completed. They have been. Okay. I, I see them from where I live. I go through Norwell and wind up in Situate. And there's definitely a sign there that says speed limit townwide is unless otherwise posted. So I'm sure there are other oh, signs. So are they just at the entrances of our town? I don't know. Got it. Yeah, okay. so they're, they're at the, basically the entrances of the town and it was uh, the change to the, um, sorry, it was cha change to the law that basically brought thickly settled from 30 miles an hour, adopted townwide down to 25 miles an hour. Okay. So it's notification to anyone driving into the community that we've adopted that 25 mile an hour, thickly settled. But that's why you don't see them elsewhere because thickly settled is now 25 throughout the community. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And Ms. Connolly, Ms. Matthews does have another comment. Okay, thank you. And you need to unmute yourself, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Um, uh, I have a question about the $50,000 um, uh, traffic survey. Is that our absolute first step or are um, you having talked with uh, Mr. Cafferty today? Um, I'm just wondering if, is there some due diligence that can be done ahead of time to determine that spending the $50,000 on the traffic study may not be worth it and we can instead do smaller things to, that cost less money to um, improve the uh, dr driving situation in the West End? Uh, let, me, let me take a shot at that. Um... If you want a truck ban, then yes, that is the absolute first thing that you need to do. Uh, we can reach out and have conversations with Norwell and Cohasset about maybe trying to do some things that would leave out some vehicles without a truck ban. 
Um, I think one of the first things we'll do is make sure uh, probably uh, Taylor Billings, our traffic officer, gets in touch with uh, Mr. Brokamp and looks at his camera and sees what kind of trucks are going up there. Um, and then enforcement, if, if it looks like it's a speed issue, enforcement is an issue. Um, if there is a large number of trucks, uh, and I know the chief would probably kill me for this, but uh, anytime you want to make trucks disappear, you bring in the state police truck unit and trucks will disappear. They will go hundreds of miles out of their way to avoid the state police truck unit. Uh, but there has to be sufficient trucks for them to come down and do it. So that's something we can look at if, if we think it's, if it's worth it. Um, I just know if you ever see them down the rotary, the state police truck unit, you will not see a truck in the rotary for the entire day. They call everybody, they stay away, they don't go there. So uh, enforcement is something we could do in the short term, uh, but we'd have to get a look and see whether, again, whether it's a speeding enforcement, whether it's overloaded vehicles, something like that. So there are some steps that we could do, uh, but really if, if the issue is we want to keep the trucks out of there, period, you have to do the traffic study. And with that, I really have to cut this discussion short. I'm sorry, we have a public hearing at seven o'clock mm -hmm. and at 7.02. So I think we have to move to that. Um, I think this is a discussion that we will obviously be continuing. So I thank everyone for participating. And I would like to say that we now have a public hearing at seven o'clock uh, to discuss, vote, Salt Society, all alcohol, liquor license, multiple amendments for alteration of license premise and change of manager, Kara Tondorf owner. I see Kara's on the call on Zoom. Kara, are you here? Uh, I see you. <laughs> Ms. Tondorf should be able to unmute herself. Kara, if you wish to do so, there you go. All right. Ms. Tondorf, you're good to go. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, now I can even see you. Oh, good. Hi, Kara. So would you like to tell us what you're doing and uh, fill us in, please? Uh, pardon me? Oh, okay. So um, I had the opportunity to um, expand um, our space at Salt Society into the, the, the space next door, uh, which is currently being occupied by Jessica Kim. Um, she has a, a therapy practice. Um, she's moving out and... Um, we are kind of, you know, we, we do a lot of sushi in our restaurant and we don't really have the space to expand the sushi bar, which is kind of like a separate kitchen in some ways because they have a lot of, you know, things that they do back there. So this will allow us the opportunity to sort of like not have to shut our takeout off. Um, oftentimes on Friday, Saturday nights, we have to shut takeout off because they just can't keep up with it. There's not enough people that can fit behind the current um, spot. We've also had a lot of requests for like private events, which we don't really have the capacity to um, to do right now. So it seemed kind of like a, a good opportunity, um, given the fact that she's organically leaving and it's it's directly abutting. So it's not like, you know, we'd have to build out a different kitchen or whatever. So um, that's kind of the goal um, for us. And that was where, where the expansion of premises came into play. Right. Does the board have any questions about expansion of premises? Um, Ms. Torndorf, have you been to the planning board yet? Uh, no. You know there's a whole process in terms of permits, et cetera. And given your location, there's probably gonna be questions about parking, et cetera. So are you, you're, you're going to do that, yes? I mean, I didn't know that I had to do that. I, I went through this process actually last spring and um, we actually went pretty far along in the process. I was never told I had to do that. So um, I just kind of pulled out because yeah, as we all know, COVID, you know, just throwing punches at us left and right. Um, I, and I was never told I had to do that. So I wasn't prepared for that. Um, simply- the process last spring was just the seating in front of the restaurant. Pardon me? The sidewalk. Last right. spring, it was the sidewalk seating. Um, correct. The, the ones that I, you know, went with you, but I did, I did put the application and I sent the abutter, the abutters notice out for, for the expansion next door as well. All right. I, a, I, it's not a big process on the where she'll have to have administrative site plan review. Uh, and it really revolves around the parking. Uh, but again, the space that's there had parking. So 
you know, the planning board, I spoke to the staff today. They didn't think it'd be a huge deal, but they do have to file for administrative site plan review. Okay. So I guess I just would need to know the steps I need to take in order to do that. Yeah, just have to reach out to Karen Joseph and the planning board and they'll be able to help you. We'll have again, touch with you tomorrow, Karen. Okay. Any other questions about the expansion inside? Andrew, <clears throat> are you raising your hand or just? I, I, I am, but I'll let Tony go first, that's fine. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, Kara, about the outside seating. How are is that ten more tables out there? No, no, it's it's adding two more. Um, it's sort of contingent upon the the approval of the extension of premises because if I do get that, it'll allow me to put more two more tables outside of the space. So, okay, so. kind of is all you know in tandem with that. Okay, and how many total seats? In addition, or is it going to be? Um, I believe I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it's like maybe eighteen more seats um, in terms of the expansion. Okay, yeah, because we do have a lot of you know we've been talking about the parking, and there's a lot of concern about the parking back there. So if there's eighteen seats, that could be I don't know eight more cars or something, and. I don't know where where they're going to park because most people want to park around there and they park in the Millwharf's um, parking lot, which is not a town-owned parking lot. Um, so we would have to, you know, planning is going to want to talk about that because there's a lot of a lot of discussion about where where that happens now. I mean, most of the spots that we have down there are down in Cole Parkway, and unfortunately, people don't want to walk that far, so they, you know, they park up in spots that really aren't there for them. So. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what the planning board says about that. But I love your restaurant, and I'm glad you're expanding. And uh, you know, the outside thing works works well with only two extra seats. I don't think that'll be a huge inconvenience either on the, you know, on the landscape outside. Okay, Andrew. I, I guess I just wanted to almost editorialize a little bit. I just wanted to thank Kara for being able to expand during the pandemic. I think these are wonderful problems we can have. The fact that we're talking about too much parking for a restaurant where other communities are having trouble trying to fill them in. And I guess it just kind of brings in, I guess I, I wanted to apologize a little bit to Kara that this, this process, and this is maybe a discussion for another day, that it's hard for one of our small business owners to know who to go to, who to talk to, what yeah. permits to get. Um, I'd love at some point for us to talk about making it a little bit easier because I, I it pains me to hear you frustrated, um, the care about not knowing where to go. So, especially um, now that I have to go back to the planning board, it's kind of like I have a very, very short window to take over this girl's lease. Otherwise, she's going to be looking for somebody else. So, it's well, kind of I'd like I'd like to say though, I would much rather see you go through the process correctly than to get through it to do building to to commit money and to find out oh you can't do that. So I understand you're frustrated, but everyone has to follow the same rules. And I, that's why I brought it up. I wanted to be sure you knew. And so if we can do something in the future to, you know, I, I'm sure Lorraine has all kinds of information that she can make available to anyone. And I, I think that last year, um, it was a diff different year. And I know that there was um, some question about the expansion of the restaurant into the interior. And that was based on some rulings that were made many, many years ago. And some, an abutter did call um, about the interior. So um, I'm sure the planning board's gonna do everything to help you make this happen expeditiously, but better to know what you're facing than to run up against it when you've spent money. Of course, and I, you know, I just wish I knew before this meeting, cause I was kind of, you know, banking on we were all set and Lorraine and Michelle and everyone, they're amazing. They're wonderful. They're full yep. of wonderful resources. Um, but, you know, that's just not something that I that I knew about, especially going last year. We, we had talked about I talked to, you know, building inspectors, everyone. And I actually walked everyone through and no one seemed to think it would be a big deal. So this is a little blindside, but whatever, you know, we roll with the punches. Well, Madam Chair, we can always, yes. um, you know, we can always make a motion pending planning board approval so yes. Kara doesn't have to come back she can no that's absolutely forward. right that's exactly correct I don't want Kara to get completely discouraged no but 
So we can vote tonight and it make it dependent on planning board and then you're good to go. So uh, no one's trying to be obstructionist here. It's just that got to do it the way we got to do it. So um, change of manager, this is a formality usually. Correct. Can you tell us who's taking over as manager? Uh, Matthew Hawksby has been with me since um, my conception and um, he uh, has taken over as the GM and um, it just, it's it sort of a, you know, admin thing that we just hadn't done and I was a little behind with it, you know, so I just wanted to do the formality and the proper channel. Right. But he's been there since the day we opened. Very good. Anyone else have anything? Is there anyone joining us from the general public? I just have one other comment, Karen. I, yes, yes, John. And, and I, I agree with Andrew um, in terms of just getting information available on the website on processes. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, I, I really would want to hear what the planning board said before we voted on this. Um, you know, and not to make you have to come back again, we can, we'll, we'll do it quickly, but I, I don't really feel completely comfortable in voting something where I personally have gotten a number of calls on parking issues down there. And I, I'd like to hear what they say before I vote on it. How does the rest of the board feel? We can choose not to vote on the- I can just step in real quick. Um, I sure. sent a letter out to the abutters uh, last April um, I not only did I send the ad out, but I sent a personal letter addressing every single person on the abutters list and um, told them my plans, told them what I wanted to do, um, said if anybody had any problems or issues or, you know, um, things that they wanted to discuss. I left my personal cell phone. I left my email. Um, I got one call and I got one call from someone who um, had suggested me put a sign on the side of the building Bell society where the egress from the Mill Wharf parking lot is just watching over pedestrians, but nobody ever said anything to me about that. So, I mean, I understand yeah. you have to go through your protocols, but I mean, yeah, I this isn't, it really isn't about you, Carrie. It's about just the expansion in that part of front street. You know, we've got that wine bar going in supposedly across the street from you which is great. We want that area to be vibrant. But I think as the board, we've got to figure out what parking alternatives are going to be for that area and, sure. and go down that path. So this really doesn't have much to do with, with your restaurant. It really has to do with what we have to do in terms of making that area more um, suitable. But especially because like the reason I'm doing it is for overflow when people are already in the harbor parks and there's a two hour wait and maybe there's a place for them to sit and get a drink. You know what I mean? They're already there, you know, but that, because that's my intention. My intention is not to like expand the actual seating. It's more of a like a waiting area, a place for people to come and, you know, do a baby shower or whatever, you know? So, yep. but, you know, just tell me what I got to do and I'll do it. Hey, just, we almost put it on a, in a chicken and egg um, position here. Uh, if the board is not going to approve this, then she's not going to bother going to the planning board. So, you know, I think she needs some sort of affirmation from the board that, that they're going to approve this. Otherwise, she, she won't even bother filing with the planning board. And, you know, I, I agree with, with Mr. Goodrich that um, people complaining that there's not enough parking in the harbor is a good thing. Uh, it means there's a lot of people in the harbor, and that's something we need to deal with. But um, it's better than the alternative that there's acres of parking and no one going to our businesses. So. I think for, for Ms. Torndorf, I think the board should take some sort of affirmative or negative uh, vote for her tonight. So she knows if the answer is no, we're not going to approve it, then she doesn't even bother going to the planning board. Uh, otherwise, she's kind of caught in this limbo that well, the selectmen haven't approved it, the planning board haven't approved it, I don't know what to do. Um, so, I, you know, again, my recommendation would be the board take some sort of a vote one way or the other so she at least has a path to know where she's going. Well, I don't hear anyone saying that that we're going to be opposed to the project. I think we're all saying many positive things about it, but I think it's 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 doing due diligence, right? It's it's another important board here that's going to have some sort of input, um, and depending on what they say, it could change our opinion. But I, I'm I'm all in favor of it, and I I seem to be the one that's saying let's wait a second. 
I mean, Kara, I, can, can I ask a question, Karen? Um, yes. Kara, can you just confirm? So you on your application, it says that the total capacity will be 86. What is it today for you? It's 66. It's 66? OK. Yeah. And it was 75 and it was oral. So not looking for much. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't seem to be a big delta to me at all. So. Yes, Andrew. Well, you, Mara, are you, you done? I'm sorry. Good. I mean, again, Oro, we're talking five different people. And, and I appreciate and I understand doing the due diligence. I, I can't fathom what the planning board would say or five additional people when you really look at it for what Oro was to what this is going to be. We're talking two cars. I think I said, oh, no, that's too much. Or, I mean, I understand that, but next door, there's already a business. What if another business wanted to open there? Uh, again, to start putting up these roadblocks, if this isn't going to happen, and then if a wine bar goes across the street and she wasn't able to, expect, I, I, I guess I just don't want to be, uh, to be, stay. so I feel comfortable moving forward. Um, if other folks do, I understand the due diligence part, but um, for me, it's a gut check. All right, could I, could I say that this needs approval of both boards. So I think the original suggestion that we could, uh, the select board could approve it pending approval of the planning board is a reasonable thing to do. So I, I don't, you know, it, if, and if they don't approve it for whatever reason, then that's another whole story. So. Um, Would you like a motion, madam? Yes, please. Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. Just, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a logistical person, and I'm sorry if I'm, you know, overanalyzing, but I'm like, so there's a business moving out who has, you know, four employees and however many potential, you know, clients that they're seeing at one given time, right? So they're abandoning their space, and I'm asking for like a minimal amount of seats to go into that abutting space. So if you if you do like simple math deduction additions like we're talking about like I just it's a little mind blowing that I'm told after like talking about this process now for over a year that I'm told that I have to go to the planning board for this it's not like I'm building a addition in the back and a roof deck and I just I I'm just a little bit I'm a little bit taken aback and it, it should be as as should be as simple as what you said that there's so many parking spots assigned to the current business based upon its usage and your usage again i don't have the plenty board numbers but it should almost be a wash right you're going to add x number of spaces they're giving up x number of spaces it should be about a wash but it's just one of the rules of the plenty board you have to back to them and have them look at it and i can certainly accept that i'm just I'm trying to give you my sort of sense of things, you know. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not here to be contrarian, but it's ours, you know, because I'm I'm prepared to make a motion to support you pending the planning board. But I don't think you can compare. I think what's in there today is what a therapy business, and this is a restaurant. The hours are different. You know, the competition for spots. I'm just trying to. Support kind of so they have a different person members. every hour where I might have people staying for two hours. So if they've got different people every hour on the hour, you know. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I'm sure the planning board looks at hours of operation to determine. Yeah. So, um, but but I'm prepared to make a motion pending planning board approval if if the board would so wish me to do that. Please. Okie dokie. Thank you. Move that the select board approve an alteration of premise for Salt Society to expand into the abutting space next door and allow for up to 10 tables extending along the front of the building on the sidewalk pending planning board approval. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. Roll call vote, please. Sorry, I had to unmute. Okay, thank um, you. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Ms. Curran. She said yes. Oh, yes. sorry, I didn't hear. And Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 4 0. 
Okay, and I also just want to mention that there is a, an agreement to use the sidewalk that we'll be sending Ms. Tondorf tomorrow okay. for Jim and uh, Kara to sign. Okay. It's very and similar a second to one. Motion. Second yeah. motion, please, Ms. Curran. Uh, move that the select board approve the application for a change of manager to Matthew Hawksley for the Salt Society at 146 Front Street for all kinds of alcoholic beverages restaurant license. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor, uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Bignani. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Um, Kara, get in touch with Lorraine tomorrow or, and or uh, Karen Joseph at the planning board. And I know they'll try to expedite this for you. We all want everyone down there to succeed. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. You, you too. too. So 715, we have discussed vote special event application, St. Patrick's Day Parade, March 20th, 2022. Ed Kelly, is it going to happen this year? Do I? Mr. Kelly Ed? is here, Ed. Yes. So, Ed, if you, is Ed, he you, muted? Could, uh, could you Ed, unmute yourself, please? Mr. Kelly, you can unmute yourself. Uh, bottom left hand corner. Bottom left hand corner. There, there we go. go. All right, I'm in. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we can have a parade this year. Um, obviously, pending your approval and. Um, yes anything substantial happening with the COVID situation. Well, so, seeing as you're an outdoor event, we right. should be able to do it. I would hope so. Well, we couldn't do it a couple of years ago, so. Right, right. Does the board have any questions? I think we're all familiar with the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yes, Maura. You're muted. Ed, what was Maura Glancy's concern? Uh, she didn't. She just wanted to know if we were going to use her space to um, have people sign in, and um, we would serve um, the refreshments out of her building, uh, which we'll be doing now out of the senior center. So we're not going. I talked to her. We're we're all set. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any. Do I hear a motion? Everybody's sure. muted. Move to approve a special event permit to Ed Kelly for the 2022 St. Patrick's Day Parade, scheduled for March 20th, 2022, from 12 p.m. until 4 p.m., with setup beginning at 10 a.m. and breakdown at 4 p.m., pending the cer Certificate of Liability Insurance and Departmental Approvals. Second. Second, Second by Mr. Vignani. All in favor, roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Form zero motion carries. Can't wait to see you on March 20th. You need that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ed. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Next, we have discuss, review, FY23 budget presentations. Uh, first up is the Waterways Enterprise Fund, number 66, which is uh, Stephen Moan, the Harbor Master. Hello, Stephen. You need to unmute yourself. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Tell us about Waterways and the Harbor this year. Waterways and the Harbor this year. Well, we had a very busy year. Um, uh, it started off a little, um, it started off very well. We um, completed our piling project uh, that was on time, came in under budget in the end. Um, so we opened the marina. Uh, everybody was pretty happy with the outcome. Uh, everybody's thrilled with gangway and the uh, the observation deck. I know uh, uh, Jim Boudreaux has been using that for a lot of his um, rallies. Rallies. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, and if you haven't been down to the marina, you should come down. We'll take you for a walk around and show you what we did. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. We also took delivery of the um, new Harbmaster boat um, and we have that in operation. Uh, we've been working uh, very closely with the fire department, training them on the operation of the fire boat um, along uh, with other agencies, you know, the PDs. Um, we had it up in 
um, uh, at one of their events, and uh, we were working with the um, uh, Paul Norton uh, from Citro PD training. Uh, he and uh, Craig Craig Keefe on the boat. <clears throat> so things went on pretty well. Uh, beginning of the year, then we had a couple of you know uh, search and rescues that didn't come out turn out so well. Uh, we did. We were able to uh, recover the bodies, and you know we worked with a lot of the agencies around, and it was pretty tragic. Uh, I hate to see any of, anything like that happen on the waterfront because it's really not the reason anybody goes to the water. Uh, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, my staff worked very very hard this year. Uh, keeping people moving along and keeping people smiling and happy. Uh, so we had a great year. Uh, I've submitted my budget with the town administrator and Nancy Holt. Uh, we did level spending this year. Uh, the only thing we, we asked for in capital was uh, for um, additional funding to complete the dredge project in the South River and to put in a second pump, pump out station for the boats over at the Jericho boat ramp. Uh, aside of that, we're pretty much on budget um, and we're watching our budget very closely. We did raise our rates this year. We went from $100 a foot for a resident for a slip to 110 and for a non-resident from 140 to 154. It was a 10% increase. And we raised the mooring rates from uh, $6 a foot to $8 a foot. So your total budget number for uh, the, the upcoming year is? Uh, let me just take a... Total budget number is one. One point. 1.271 is our proposed budget for this year coming up. So you requested 1.296 and the approved budget was $25,000 less. And what does that 25,000 represent? The um, so we, we had asked for uh, 1.52 and then one two. Uh, the proposed budget is one two seven one. Well, that's for twenty three. Okay, thank you. And a lot of these figures, um, when Nancy does the budget, she kind of holds back. You know, um, would rather. Um, look at the figures for the proposed budget as under what we probably normally bring in than what we're, you know, than what we really will bring in. She's conservative, right? <laughs> She's very conservative. That's the yes. word I'm looking yes. for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the word to use. And, she does, and Nancy does a great job. Yes. She keeps me in check. <laughs> yes. And she does it nicely. Yes. Uh, does the board have any questions? I'm... No, 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 I don't see anything. I don't see anyone. So Stephen, thank you for coming in and we appreciate all the work you do down in the Harbor. Um, I still, are, are the the docks still in at the Cole Parkway like they're supposed to be? I haven't been down there to look. Everything stayed in this year. We didn't oh, take anything out. Good, so, good. Uh, not, not so much as, as one finger float, everything stayed in the water. That's and that's great. the way we're going to keep it from now on, uh, which is a savings on financially and wear and tear on the equipment. And not to dogs. mention the, the aesthetics of it and the... And the, <laughs> and the aesthetics. Yeah. And so. the smell. <laughs> and the smell. That too. So, All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in, Stephen. But I'd love it if you come by and take a walk and kind of show you what we're doing. We are... I do have a grant in with Seaport right now for we're requesting a million dollars uh, to replace the docks at Cole Parkway. And that would complete 
uh, phase two, which would complete the, you know, the marina renovation. Great. We also have an application in to complete the dredging of the South River with Marshfield. I'm not sure Steve mentioned that. So that's a million dollar project. We need to put up 250,000 and Marshfield needs to put up 250,000. If we get the grant, we'll dredge down to um, the first bridge, I think it is, Steve. Yeah, the C Street Bridge. That's correct. And that would come from Waterways Enterprise Fund retained earnings? The, the 250,000 would come from the retained earnings, yes. And we would be remiss if we didn't thank the Waterways Committee for all of their hard work. They're that, a very uh, diligent committee and I know they um, they care a lot. So they thank work very you. hard, they do a great job yeah. and more has done, um, more from the select board's done a great job uh, working with us as well. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, I do have a question. Um, where are we with the Jericho Park? The Jericho with Doug Park. Cam Doug Cameron and his his renovation over there? Yeah, we're still working on that. Um, he has some preliminary sketches and some designs out. I, I uh, sent them out to Waterways two meetings ago. I don't know if you saw them or not. Um, I don't think I, I didn't because I, I wasn't there. I can probably, I can email those out to you. Okay, I'd love to see them. You know, right. send them to Andrew too, because I, I think it'll be really important for Andrew's group as well that's working on uh, the community harbor building. Okay. To see, because the more that we can align in those two spaces, the better off I think we'll all be. Yeah. Well, and they're just getting ready to send out an RFP. So, you know, it, the, it would be nice if these two projects somehow or other- Kind of melded, melded together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Do you want me to stay on and um, take care of the shellfish? I don't see Mike DeMeo on the call. Oh, sure. I, I should have been looking for him. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, we just do that next? Yes. yes. It, it's right it's behind, you know, that's why. Yep, perfect. Um, shellfish is staying level funded. I know Mike has been working um, with uh, Division of Marine Fisheries and the Shellfish Commission uh, to come up with some sort of plan up in Cohasset to do some uh, shellfish grants in other areas that are not um, uh, as concerning to some of the residents in, in Cohasset. All right. So, well, and I assume that Mike Mike's a good guy. Um, yeah, he's working on the uh, the issue of the closure of the shellfish beds in the north. He is. River. Yes, he is. I and know he's we... working with uh, he's working with um, David Daphne um, and with Division of Marine Fisheries and the town of Marshfield. I know they sent yeah. a letter to the Division of Marine Fisheries uh, oh. asking them to reopen it, and we followed suit a little bit later asking them the same thing. So um, hopefully. Hopefully it'll get open back up. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's, that's about it. That's, that's enough, that's good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for zooming in. No worries, have a great night and come stop by the marina. So let me take you for a walk around. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Consider Thank an you. invitation. And Thank, thank the board. I want to thank the board for all their help throughout the year. Thanks, right. Stephen, for all your hard work. Have Next up, evening. we have, I see Kevin Kelly, facilities. Kevin, would you like to tell us about the year you've had? Sure, There's good evening. Kevin. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so we had a, a good year in facilities, a busy year, as always. Um, it's always something different going on in the world of buildings, uh, which is a good thing. Um, uh, keeping up with uh, the pandemic and changes thereof with the pandemic and uh, keeping the building's signage up to date and current and um, all the addressing the concerns of not only the staff, but also residents as they use the buildings. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, it's still constantly still keeping us busy. As we all know, um, the um, <clears throat> we finished uh, construction of the senior center, 
And then um, we also <clears throat> created a new space for the food pantry in Old Gates. And then we opened the senior center, um, which we all know, and uh, working with figuring out how that whole campus is working and uh, going through those uh, growing pains with both buildings in use and um, pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic and all those types of things. And um, <clears throat> we also started um, the a, um, facilities uh, part-time administrator in the department, which has been a great help. And uh, we're hoping that will help us greatly with uh, accomplishing more of our goals and getting um, not as much more organized, but getting rubber to the road type thing and getting things going in process because we're, as it is now, we're just currently running around dealing with issues. So um, that will what help us that, a lot. What is that person's function? <clears throat> so she's an, a facilities administrator. So she's been doing administrative tasks. So she is taking okay, care good. of helping us with billing and um, uh, contracts. And we're waiting for a, uh, a program through Munis to come online with um, for um, work request system and get that going and get those things going and get more formalized with building contracts and those types of things. So help us with all those administrative type details. Great, great. And so your total budget request for this year was? Um, my total budget request was 1.280, I believe. Yep, 1.280. And that was the town administrator's um, recommendation as well? Yes. Very good. We moved some things around in some areas to accomplish a few other things with some mostly utility type things, uh, senior center to accommodate sweet senior center and so forth. Right. Well, it's been a busy year for you. Does the board have any questions? Question, no? uh, Kevin. Yes, Tony. The, a, the HVAC uh, person, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. So it, with the school system, school department, we are requesting for a new FTE, an HVAC mechanic and technician. Um, and that would be funded by the, the school and by the town. And then that person would come in and do not only just the first response for all our HVAC needs, but do a lot of the things that can be handled by one person, filter changes, small repairs, small boiler repairs, small chiller repairs. Um, you know, we currently spend, I think about $300,000 annually on HVAC between the school and the town. And we think that this position could take a 60, 70% bite into that position, into that number. Just for maintenance. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, when Jim mentioned that, I, I was surprised by the amount of time that that your resources use towards HVAC. It, it's actually amazing. Part of it is just new technology. You know, there's no such thing as just going and checking a thermostat and running down and checking a boiler. You have to go to the computer first. Then you have to go back and check settings and there's a lot of electronics and there's a, little, there's a lot of learning curve at, at each building. Um, and it just takes time it, to it, it, and get to find out what the settings are on the computer and what when one thing doesn't work right, that means something else isn't working right. And the, the filter changes alone. I mean, the, the middle school at the high school and middle school campus, I think there's um, 850 filters in the building. Oh. And it's just amazing. And some of those are handled by the current staff at the schools and some of them are handled by outside personnel. Wow. So just the cost of the filters alone is a big number. And so that's just, that's just a number there. I mean, in, in our buildings alone, there's a lot, there's a lot of filters too, but that's, that's a huge number. Okay. Well, and with a brand new senior center, a fairly brand new library, a brand new uh, middle school, there's one other building I'm forgetting. Oh, the public safety building. That's a lot of new buildings with a lot of new technology. So um, maybe grab someone out of the South Shore Road Tech. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be nice. New technology, but um, if anything good came out of COVID, we spent a tremendous amount of money bringing all the HVAC and the buildings back up to 
up to snuff. It's probably working better than it has in I don't know how long. So uh, we want to keep that running and make sure we keep that at optimal performance. So this is a, as a position, uh, another one of those when you see we get the state aid and would probably be something we would look with the uh, financial forecast committee to do as a shared cost with the school. Question, Laura? Thank you. Kevin, I'm, the vacant position under your custodians, that's not the HVAC, right? That's a vacancy that you have in addition to the, the added position that you're requesting for next budget? Correct. That is the custodial position for the, uh, which is going to support the senior center and recreation. How long has that been posted? Uh, we have posted, it's been posted for, I'm going to say five months, maybe six. Hmm. We've interviewed several times. Um, uh, we're getting ready to repost again and uh, go through another round of candidates. It, it's really been a uh, interesting market to, yeah. to get people into positions. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> No? All right. Well, Kevin, thank you very much and congratulations on the new senior center being opened up. Um, yet another milestone in town. Yes, it's great. Yeah. We're, we're gonna do our best to take good care of it. You will, we know you will. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you all, thank you. Good night. Thanks, Kevin. Good night. Thank you. Now, now we have Seth, who's always on our calls. <laughs> now you get to talk about your department, Seth. I love that, I love that. You've yeah. had a busy two years, what with getting us all up and on Zoom and various platforms. And uh, so I just, on, the half, on behalf of the board, many, many, no one knows how hard Seth works. And um, really, thank you, thank you. You've got it, you got it. So um, I can hustle through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, for the record, Seth Pfeiffer, director of the Towns TV department. Um, our numbers really do tie right into our narrative. So I'm gonna jump straight to the numbers. Um, once again, even though I know the board is very aware of this, I'd like to remind you as well as anyone that's not familiar, this department's budget will be different than every other budget you've heard from and that we are not taxpayer funded. Our, we have a separate contract with Comcast. Um, uh, we are about halfway through. We have a 10-year contract with Comcast. We're about halfway through it right now. And um, just so you, uh, the board is aware, we have about um, a million in our bank that we spend for ourselves only. It sounds like a lot, but again, this is our lifeline. The more we spend now, the more um, we shorten our existence. So we spend wisely and conservatively, and this is exactly how we're doing it. We have two parts to our budget. One is the salaries, then in the second one is how we're spending at salaries. There is no, nothing major, uh, no major changes except for the usual annual increases. Where we're spending the money, there are three parts here. One, basic TV equipment. This will be a staple on all of our, um, all of our budgets. It is basic TV equipment, cameras, tripods, um, adapters, camera bags. Number two, uh, stu uh, studio field equipment. Once again, we are not necessarily desk people, although I spend a lot of time in front of a computer now, um, but no, we are usually out and about and this can encounter things such as monitors, extension cords. In fact, one thing we're dealing with now is when we do um, sporting events and there is weather out there, we need to figure out a sort of tent, literally to figure how we do that. If you are not familiar, by the way, I've been asked before if we are covering sporting events. Yes, we have, we are and have. In fact, this year we've covered about 98% of home situate um, games, football, field hockey, basketball, all those. If you're not, if you're not aware of that, go and um, like and subscribe to our Facebook page because we stream them live there. And then we put the rebroadcast re them on, um, on uh, channel 22. Uh, number three, this is of how we're spending our money. This is our new adventure in the new normal. Um, once again, as predicted before, we uh, our department is permanently changed in the way we present things. A, of course, we still provide TV coverage, but now we provide virtual coverage. So um, we continue to look into that. We have already purchased three um, three products totaling about 20K. Um, one is in the uh, select board room, one is in the school, one travels with us. And already with the one that travels with us, the little owl that you've probably seen around, there's a new addition to it. So um, it's just our continued adventures into that. I do wanna say this is that obviously we are looking towards um, April of, uh, of this year 
when new guidance comes from the state regarding government meetings. And now, if you're not familiar, that right now we have the option to meet in person, virtually, or hybrid. Um, and then in April of this year, we're going to get new guidance from the state that should educate us as to whether we can continue doing that or if government meetings have to go back into person. My belief is that this uh, system we're using now will probably stay the same. I think there, the majority of people enjoy the option of being able to meet remotely versus in person and meeting in person is certainly important in certain scenarios, but if you have the option to meet virtually, um, it helps. Uh, with that said, if the guidance comes and says that government meetings have to go back to uh, meeting in person, it will still not affect our department because once again, government meetings are a part of what we do. Uh, we also deal with other town organizations, businesses. Uh, we deal with the school system, the school organizations. So they enjoy like the virtual elements to this. So we need to be able to provide that. And uh, this money goes towards being able to do that. And that is the Situate TV's budget presentation. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Well, I, I actually have a question of Jim. Uh, Jim, do we have to do anything to change our own town bylaws about how we hold meetings? Uh, you have to change the board's policy. Okay, so it's simply policies. There's, it, it's, there's nothing in the bylaws. Correct. Okay, good. Thank you. Does the board have any questions to ask of Seth or comments, et cetera? Tony, Hi. I see Tony. Go ahead, Mark. No, you can go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't have any questions, Seth. I do I do just want to uh, reiterate what Karen just said and really thank you for, for your dedication to the town um, and really the efforts that you do. You're at every event personally. And I love the fact that you engage the high school kids and give them experience and training and really a potential career path. So the, the collaboration with the school is spectacular and the effort that you give the town is spectacular also. So it does not go unnoticed, certainly to anyone on the board. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I'd like, yeah, thank you. I'd like to echo that. Just thank you so much, Seth. You're everywhere. And um, I know all the boards and committees really appreciate your presence and we appreciate it as well. I do have a question. So years ago we had, you know, this, this money that we do have set aside from Comcast, like as you indicated in the beginning, right? We've got a pretty good balance in there. Um, and you had started looking at more internet streaming solutions. And I know you've been sidetracked with COVID and, and managing all of this, this nonsense very well. Um, plans in the upcoming year to kind of get that talk track back on the table and moving forward as cable starts to wane and? Um, actually, I would say that I think those original plans have been derailed and probably gone from my perspective because what we figured out is what we wanted to do was able to stream whatever was out there online and we are doing that right now. I think the TV element, we still are, for instance, when we think about when we began this and that people were not able to watch your meetings live, but we would say, they would be available the following day on TV, mm -hmm. that was sufficient. So instead of investing money to be able to stream things directly live onto TV, being able to put them online, I think is uh, more important for uh, residents to be able to see. Does that make Agreed. sense? Agreed. So, so are, you, are you gonna reconvene the cable committee so everybody's on the same page with next steps? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Andrew? I'm just convinced Seth has a twin out there because he's at everything. <laughs> <laughs> so just th thank you for- I, I, I actually asked Seth if he's, does he ever take a vacation? <laughs> and he didn't actually answer me. So I think the answer is no. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, with our great appreciation, Seth, and sorry, you can't leave like everyone else can leave. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I see Pam Avatabli. And I don't, are, are you handling the rest of the, the, uh, the treasure collector budget items? Or is Nancy part of this? I know uh, that would be me. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Welcome. 
So, good evening. I'm, I'm, this is why Seth can't no, leave. No, I know. No, Pam, you're fine now. Pam, you go ahead. You're fine. No, uh, Pam, on your, um, on your phone. On your phone. Let's see here. Okay. There you go. Pam, Pam, do you see it on your phone? I'm asking you to unmute on your phone. There. There you go. Yeah, so I'm Seth's problem child. <laughs> no, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely am. So um, thank you, Seth. Sorry. Uh, my computer doesn't like me talking into it, so I have to use my phone and look at you on my computer. So good evening and uh, nice to see everyone this way once again. Uh, so I will start with my treasurer collector budget. Uh, we had a busy year, of course, with COVID. We have a 90% plus collection rate. Uh, we've sold a ton of stickers because of all of our new residents. This is our biggest year yet. Uh, we sold over, well, close to 7,500 beach stickers, uh, not, in count, not including the 350 ones we have sold to non-residents. And plus, um, we've done about 108 replacements for people that have bought new cars. Uh, 6,800 transfer station stickers to date. Um, so we, um, we're busy still with stickers and we start selling the new bunch of stickers. Happy Valentine's Day on Valentine's Day. So, um, Nancy and Jim and myself and Julie had a meeting and decided to sell non-resident stickers, speech stickers only online this year. Uh, we sold out in less than an hour last year. So this seems to be uh, the most effective and um, best way we think to do it fairly this year. So we've been um, sending out email blasts and lots of non-residents are calling and will probably blow up Unipay's <laughs> a site that morning, but we'll deal with that if it happens. Uh, so other than that, um, we've worked really hard on uh, collecting, well, actually haven't, I just started to work really hard again on collecting tax title. Uh, I kind of gave everybody a break with COVID, um, but, uh, no more. I sent out 25 letters in December. Uh, I've collected um, about close to, let me see how many parcels as of today, 25 parcels uh, for FY22 already um, and a close uh, and a lot of money. So um, it's time to buckle down again. Uh, I hate doing this. Um, but it needs to be done. As Jim mentioned, I'm very proud about our how our auction went uh, last week. Uh, we had a lot of people show up, only six bidders, but a lot of interest in the property. Uh, it was a construction, um, a gentleman that does construction in the area that bought the home. So I think the neighbors will be very pleased with what he's going to do to the home. Uh, he's used to working with our building and planning department. Um, I think he's a top-notch guy, so I'm thrilled um, for the purchase. Uh, and nothing much else to report except for a successful and busy year. I'll be coming to you in a couple of weeks to um, roll a bit, roll, roll a band and add a couple of new projects to it. Uh, Nancy's just waiting on a, um, an answer for what we can, what we have to ask to borrow for the senior center, because we have donations and other monies we'd like to apply towards that, but we're trying to figure out what we can actually use and what we can't use. Uh, so, um, because the band's not going to be a substantial money, we won't have to have another uh, standard and poor's review. Which, Yahoo, that's a good thing. <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's a lot of work. Nancy does most of it, but it's one less thing off her plate this time. Yes. Um, so uh, my budget, I asked for 441419 and the town administrator gave me that. 
the only increases I have is in sal personnel salaries, 11430 and the other increase is $1,000 in postage. As you know, the postage for the whole town flows out of my budget. And because of the postage increase and different mailings, we thought the town clerk was gonna have to do. Uh, it's not gonna be as bad this time, but I do think the $1,000 is a good, uh, we're definitely gonna use that money. Um, especially even with mailing out all the speech stickers now. Um, because we're going to try to do as much as we can online. So um, does anyone have any questions on my treasure collector budget? Anyone from the board? No? I, it's a very well run operation. Thank you, Pam. I have a, a quick question. Yes, Andrew. Just on the, the ambulance receipts, how, how like, I know you go through comps, a comp star for the billing, is most of that coming in from health insurance companies or are we yes oh, do they go directly to do is any percent ever come just to a, a resident directly or you know not many come from residents directly um mostly come from insurance companies whatever insurance companies don't pay uh i then uh if there's small balances left i then pass it on to the deputy collector for uh, them to try to collect. Um, they haven't been very successful in turning over a lot of money to us um, in the past year or so, but I do think the money's coming in. Um, you know, we're right on a right on million dollars. So um, I think we do a pretty good job of collecting the money. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, I was more yeah. fearful of some resident being having a large bill and maybe not having insurance but process um, something a two thousand dollar bill That's yeah all. well nancy nancy and jim and the chief um review those and uh if anybody has a problem you know they yeah they refund it and they wipe it off right nance do you want to add anything to that Yes. There's, there's a hardship application process within the, the board's current policy on ambulance collection. Sorry, I was ignorant of that. My fault. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Anybody else? I'll just add one thing, Pam. I, I, again, as we say to most of the people, you do a great job behind the scenes. And uh, the one thing I always like about the conversations I have with you is how fair you are to the residents and you give them every opportunity and are very willing to work with them, work out some sort of payment plan of any amount to get, get back in the right um, situation. As you just mentioned a second ago, you get no pleasure whatsoever in having to go to that next step. So, uh, you know, we in the town appreciate your efforts to really be fair to all the residents and that are making an effort to get this, get their situations taken care of. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud I've only auctioned off two homes in Situate since I've been here for, um, might as well say, 10 years close to it. I um, don't, you know, take any pleasure in it. And the two homes I did auction off were walkaways and uh, no one was in them anymore. Um, I don't uh, force uh, foreclosures unless I think some people are holding out and we do have those residents. Um, we do seem to have some hard, uh, more hardships now because of COVID, definitely. But again, uh, I just want to put out there to the residents that it's um, better to say something to me than not, you know. And uh, some a little bit is better than nothing at all. That's my my stance on the whole thing. Ooh, my lights just went out. <laughs> Oh, uh, Pam. <laughs> didn't pay your bill, Pam. Got electricity budget again. Let's check that line <laughs> item. I'm afraid of the dock. <laughs> so oh, next um, is debt service. Okay, so tax foreclosure. Do you mind doing that? One fifty-eight. Oh, I, I thought we were just. I thought we just did that. Never mind. Yeah, we kind of 
we can we kind of did do that. So if we wanted to go move on, does that unless there's we're good? Um, unless there's something else to say. No, I don't okay. have anything to say. All right. Okay. Great. So debt, um, as you know, uh, we try to keep it level funded every year. Uh, I think we do a Jim and Nancy and I do a good job at that. Uh, so it is that's what we've come up with. Like I said, we'll have a small band rolling and um, the next couple of weeks we'll, I'll be coming to you to present that. Uh, we don't think we will be bonding this year at all. Um, so the rates are definitely gonna increase. So we'll definitely keep an, keep an eye on all the markets. But I don't really have much to say about it. Much. Anybody Any has questions? Question? Questions from the board? All right. Okay. And the next one, Columbus County Retirement, is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, as they told us years ago, we were going to increase every year at 8%. And ta-da, this is the year we're going to increase by 8%. Um, you know, uh, there's 52 units in the retirement system now. Uh, uh, they want, I do want you to know that they have bought their own building now. They're no longer renting anything. They um, bought a building on 16 Industrial Park Road. Uh, they've had to make some uh, repairs to the building. It's pretty run down. It came with a warehouse also. So they're hoping to lease out the warehouse to uh, can't cover the cost of the new building. Um, the audit, the 200, the 2020 audit is up on their website now if anybody wanted to look. Um, they claim that they're 60, now 67% funded of the unfunded liability that is supposed to be fully funded. They're still saying in 2029. Because of this number kind of being the number, it is what it is. I just want the board to know that the advisory board has requested a meeting with Plymouth County Retirement. Uh, they're getting some questions together for them. Uh, Nancy will be initiating um, the questions and be uh, asking for a meeting with Plymouth County Retirement. So. Uh, they have some serious questions. It's been a problem for them for a while now. I know you you also have some questions. So um, I don't know if that has been decided yet, Nance, but probably not because they just requested it last week, right? Right, they're still waiting for the questions. Okay. Nancy, the, the advisory committee has perennially asked for this particular meeting has have they ever had one yes they had one probably three or four years ago okay um, they weren't happy with the outcome of the meeting but right it was what it was right right all hmm. right all right so an opev also rent is you know at two percent um of the plymouth county retirement assessment every time although uh, we have given a little bit extra, as you're well aware, at town meetings, to, at a town meeting vote. So uh, right now we are $113 million unfunded in OPEB in our last uh, actuarial, actuarial report. <laughs> I can't say that word, uh, which is a, little, a bit concerning, but um, we always know OPEB will always be what it is. I, you know, I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah. Anyone from the board want to weigh in that on that subject? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. Right now in the bank, we have $1.9 million in the OPEP fund. Okay. All right. So on to contributory group insurance. Uh, we have estimated a 7% increase. Uh, we've had a lot of high claims in the last couple of years. 
Um, so we are hoping it'll only be 7%. We think it might be a little bit higher, but because of our 2% savings from the post 65 retirement issue that you voted to accept, we're hoping that it's only a 7% increase because we're going to save money. We're supposed to save 2% um, of the Maya. And we won't know until the end of January, beginning of February, what that number actually is. Uh, we have um, since June 1st to December 31st, we have 16 new enrollments. Um, it's a little concerning because um, for a the town part of an individual plan, it costs the town $7,384. And for a family plan, it costs $16,221. Uh, so with COVID, with our spouses losing their jobs and us, our teachers and our employees having to pick up the family and the insurance costs, um, it is what it is. You know, we have to insure our people, but it's costly to the town, that's for sure. So. Any questions? Questions? Nope. No questions. I'll just I'll just add to it that the financial forecast committee reviewed that. Nancy presented it all to us and we talked about the changes in it. <clears throat> and it's all in the financial forecast at, at the levels that Pam just described. So mm -hmm. it's just one of those there. Yeah. Yes. One of those others, it is what it is type of thing. And then finally, and last but not least, federal taxes. As we do every year, we uh, do a 4% annual increase uh, over the prior year's budget. Uh, this is for cost of living and step increases. And um, we seem to be on, on tune with that number every year when we do the 4%. That's all I have to say. All right. Well, if the board doesn't have anything else, um, again, thank you. As, as Tony pointed out, the behind the scenes work is amazing. And uh, every time I go in to pay my taxes, because I like to go in and see everyone, everyone's busy. And, um, you know, thank you for everything, Pam and company. Okay. All right. Yep. I, I got a great staff. So Yes, you do. I, I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. They're very nice. And I like, okay. in there. I'm yeah. thankful for Nancy and Jim, too. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Pam. Good night. Good night. Yes. Oh, I thought Andrew was waving goodbye, right? Yes, just waving. Yeah. All right. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule. Uh, we do have a review, discuss, vote, water resources, but I'm thinking that if we want to give everyone time to be here, um, Jim, well, Everything else is discuss vote. Is there anything we can, can we do the discuss vote the drain layers licenses? I mean, if you want to move, we can take the cell phone stuff and do that right now if you want. Okay, Start all right. So we don't have yeah, to let's, go let's, right by okay. the, the times. Great, let's do that. So Jim, okay. the cell tower lease. The cell tower lease. So the cell tower lease is up uh, in 2023. We've been receiving calls from the companies about renewing that lease or extending that lease. This is for the one cell tower behind the town hall. Uh, so we did do an RFP. We had a town meeting approval to do this in 2020. We received two responses, one from Crown Castle Holdings, which is the current holder of the lease on the towers and another from the Wireless Edge Westchester Group, LLC. Um, Kevin, Cafferty, Nancy, and I all reviewed the proposals. Um, the Crown Castle Holdings as a global signal acquisition we felt was the best proposal. Um, the other one actually was not complete, so we were able to completely review it. It does, um, the one that we are recommending to you does have an increase in the base rent, and it also has a increase in the amount of sublet that we would get from the proceeds of the sublet. 
So um, the big thing for this was uh, with T-Mobile and some of the consolidations, uh, the companies want to make sure that they can keep that location. Otherwise, they will start seeking other locations. So we wanted to get this out, uh, make sure they knew we were renewing this and they could keep that location there uh, into the future. So that's why we did it, why we put it before you. Um, the base rent amounts to uh, about almost a million three over a 20-year period, uh, plus the 35% sublet allotments that we would get from whoever many carries are under. So it's a lucrative deal. It maintains the tower that we have, and it will prevent carriers from jumping onto different towers uh, because of uncertainty about the duration of our lease. Any questions from the board? Yes, Tony. Yeah, just Jim, can you go over the numbers? How much more rent are we getting? And so currently, uh, as of September 2021, the town is receiving $7,500 roughly a month from, from Crown. Uh, the base rent was $3,552 and then 30% of the three sublets, which was an additional $1,400 and change for one, uh, about $1,200 and about $1,300 for the other ones. The new rent, the base goes from the $3,552 to $4,000 starting July 1st, 2023. That goes up 3% annually. And then instead of 30% of the three sublets, we receive 35% of the net sublet proceeds from any sublet. So uh, the million three that I referenced is just the rent that we would get from the base over a 20 year period. Over a 20 year period. So, so annually we get four grand, so 50 grand on rent. And another, so about a hundred grand a year, is that right? Well, it's four grand a month, right? We'll get four grand a month in rent. Yeah, annually though, that'll be about 50 grand. And then another 50 grand for sublet stuff. Yeah, Nancy, you have to go over those numbers. I'm reading it off your sheet. Sure. Yeah, um, the, the sublets is where we, you're right, probably about another 50 grand. And it depends on whether or not there's any um, consolidation. So if they add a carrier, then we get more money. If they can, if two of the carriers like T-Mobile and AT&T combine, um, then we'll, we would get less because they would only have one. Uh, they won't re uh, reveal to us the names of the sub lessees. So, but we suspect that they're T-Mobile, AT&T, and then DISH may be there or DISH may be one that will be coming. Is so it based 4, on... Sorry, Tony, again. Is that based on rent or I thought we got 35% of net profit? No, we get 35% of their um, sublets. Sublet not, rent? I mean, yeah, how would- of their, of their rent. So it's not based on their profit. I see. Okay. Have we compared this to what any other deals that other people have for, for tower rentals? It was more than what we were being offered before we went out to bid. We were getting a lot of low ball offers and being told that we wouldn't get the rent that we had been seeing. So actually I was surprised, I don't know about Jim and Kevin, um, at what we actually were offered in the rent proposal once we had done finished the evaluations. Yeah, they, they came in higher than we thought. They had come to us and said, this is what they'll pay us. We made sure we told them how to go out to bid. And when we went out to bid again, as, Mar as Nancy said, it came in higher than what they had been offering us previously. So um, those are pretty good numbers. I know it's a little higher than what Norwell's getting, but I'm not sure where they are in their lease at the high school. So Jim, if I could ask the question, and maybe this is obvious to everyone but me, um, even if we didn't get rent, we need the coverage, right? If, if we got rid of the tower. It, it's gonna go somewhere. Okay, so that tower fills a hole in the coverage. Right. So if, so if we didn't do this, uh, then they would go look to locate a tower someplace else and whoever on that property would then get the rent. Because we know private, uh, private property owners can rent or right. let, a, let a tower get put up in their yard. Right. We, we have a cellular, cellular uh, wireless bylaw. However, they can get around that if the carrier can demonstrate that there's a, quote, hole in the coverage, unquote. Right. Um, obviously, this tower is in a pretty strategic location on 3A. So if we just said no, they would just find another place to do it. Uh, and whoever, again, whoever was that homeowner would then get the money 
and the revenue from the tower. Right. Well, there's, there's, an, there's no denying. I, I think a lot of people think it's an eyesore. It's too bad it is where it is, um, but there's a there's reasons for it. So um, I don't want anyone out listening to us think we don't aren't aware of the fact it's ugly um, and that we do get revenue from it. But just as importantly, it provides coverage for cell phone and other users in town. So anyone else on the board? Yes. Nancy? I just want to say it also has our public safety microwave equipment is up there as well. Right. Anyone else? No, no uh, thank you. I think it's a good job for to be able to increase that piece. So thank you. So do I hear a motion? Let me find it. No, the... no motion. Move that the select uh -huh. board award a lease of municipal property for wireless communications to global signal acquisition to LLC commencing on July 1st, 2023, pursuant to their response to the town of Situate's June 2021 request for proposals for an initial term of five years with the option of three five-year extensions. The base rent for year one will be $4,000 a month to be increased 3% annually, in addition to which the town will receive 35% of the sublet new proceeds monthly. Second. Second. I'll second it, but I do have a further question. All right, why don't you ask your question first and then we'll do the second, if that's all right. Yeah, whatever you want. Um, yeah. Jim, what's what's the uh, option on the five-year renewals? Do we have the ability to get out? What What is the language on that? Uh, I'd have to look, Nancy, you know, off the top of your head. Um, I think it automatically renews unless we give notice, but I can, like I said, I, I, like he said, I can check it right now. Okay. Well, would that make a difference in anyone's vote? It might. It, is it possible to find the answer before we vote or can we, can we go back and rescind the vote if we don't like the terms of the renewal? Well, generally renewal is, is up to us and you generally have to have a reason not to renew. Yeah. And it's, so it's essentially a 20 year lease, right? Five and three renewals? Yeah, it, it, depending on the technology, right? And is that how long the last one was, 20? I believe it was. It's amazing what you come to the end of that. Yeah. What would the board like to do? I'll vote in favor it then, then if we want to, um, Depending on what Nancy says, we could, like you said, we can reconsider. I'm looking at it right now. So, I'll... and you're muted. I, I'm reading it right now. Okay, you're muted. Can't hear you. I think she needs some time to read it. Oh, I, I thought to... she was going to read it to us. Oh, yeah, I'm no, sorry. No. Forgive no. me. Forgive me. I could try to fill some dead air here. <laughs> I think it's a good, if you've read anything, Elon Musk and all those other companies putting satellites up there to send, uh, we, we not 20 years, hopefully we'll still be using cell phone towers. Could be a good deal for us. Just trying to buy you some time, Nancy. I don't think there will be. So that's just my. <laughs> Madam Chair, the yes. sample um, lease that we included with the RFP says that the agreement will automatically renew for three additional terms of five years each, unless tenant provides landlord notice of intention not to, to renew not less than 90 days prior to the expiration of the initial term or any renewal term. So basically, it's on them to tell us they don't want to renew, not the reverse. But we, it's not the reverse. So Otherwise, we're going to keep paying us. We're, and we're going to, we're locked in for the 20 years unless they decide to walk away. Yep. Nope. So that's the answer. So. Not the best language for us. No. 
I'm going to guess it's the identical language from the current lease that we have, because that's not something we would have changed. Yeah. Okay. I believe there's awesome language in there, Tony, if they leave, that they have to make sure they take down the tower and yeah. lots of other stuff. So we're not just stuck with the tower. Yeah, I recall that. But as Andrew said, the only way they're going to walk away is if the technology changes to the point that they just don't need it anymore. Right, and they can reevaluate every five years. 20 years ago, you would have said that's going to happen, and it actually didn't. Hmm. All right. So motion by Ms. Curran. Anything else? Do I, I did I get a second by Mr. Goodrich? Well, second second by Mr. No, Goodrich. Yeah. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. For nothing, motion carries. Thank you. So it is 821. Um, is do I see I see Becky's here? Miss Malament is here, yes. Yes. And uh, is there anyone else with you tonight, Becky, that you want? Okay. So Becky, you have some ideas. The Water Resources Committee has some proposals, and they, they all, almost all relate to water conservation, which I think everyone agrees is even if we weren't running out of water, <laughs> we should still conserve water. So would you like to tell us about your proposals? Sure, thank you. And thank you for being flexible this evening. Um, I do have, I see Bruce Arbonnes is also in the, on the call, who's on the uh, Water Resources Commission as well. Is he Nanette? Yes. He's Nanette on my screen. Yes, yes. So if he wants thank to you. chat. Thank you, Bruce. More than welcome to. Um, so I actually have two uh, updates on two proposals that I brought to you all in June. And one is an update on... Um, a policy, I shouldn't say policy, but um, a, a new requirement that was passed as part of the new water conservation bylaw that was passed at the town meeting last spring. So in your uh, backup materials, there's a, what was a spreadsheet that kind of shows tasks, what's left for each of these projects. So I'm actually gonna start at the bottom um, and go start with um, the new requirement from the water conservation bylaw, which is the registration of in-ground irrigation systems. Um, so I met with Jim um, last month and reviewed all of this with him. So this is kind of his and my um, collaboration. Um, so in order to have that happen, um, we're going to create a flyer to include with the water bills and to also post online that would have people uh, let us know if they have an in-ground irrigation system. Very, we'll make it a very simple registration process. We'll set a date by which that registration needs to be completed. There will likely be a fine if you don't meet that date. Um, and then for any new systems that are registered, you know, as of now, they would just be private wells. They would also, we'd also create a system for those uh, private wells. I imagine that kind of when they're approved by the Board of Health, I believe now your systems will, a lot of systems will be talking to each other. So hopefully there's a way that, you know, once a new private well is um, approved by the Board of Health, it could then also be registered as an in-ground irrigation system with the um, water department. Um, so that's a pretty, should be a pretty easy, seamless uh, new process. Um, and that will allow us to just better understand the wells that are being used uh, for irrigation throughout town. Right now we don't have much information there. Um, the next is rebates. So this is a program that was approved at town meeting a year or so ago, maybe it was last spring. Um, it's all so fuzzy. Um, so we worked, we had an intern who helped us out this summer and then the Water Concert Resources Commission, we looked at a bunch of other um, cities and towns in Massachusetts, as well as a, a couple of other cities um, nationwide that have really robust um, rebate, rebate programs and kind of looked at what we think our rebate program should look like, specifically how much um, the rebate would be for specific appliances in areas of the house. So that is under the water conservation rebate program proposal in your backup. Um, I think you get these at, as printouts, right? Or do you get these as electron files? We get them electronically. Okay. Um, so the first tab is what our proposal is. Um, I don't know if you want me to read through it or um, just take a look, but we would be awarding rebates for water sense rated toilets. That's a program run by EPA. Um, Energy Star rated washing machines, irrigation um, or rain or moisture sensors, a rain barrel, removal of an irrigation system, 
water sense rated shower heads, water sense rated faucets, and then also um, air faucet aerators that we would simply twist on to your faucet, super simple, two or three dollars, save some money. Um, and all of those items, again, are based on other cities and towns that we saw in Massachusetts. We can dig into that if you have any questions. It's in the second tab if you get that, you got that as an Excel document versus a PDF. Um, so again, we, Jim and I think this is something that can be handled relatively seamlessly. We need to add a line item into the water department budget for the first year in order to fund this. And then once we see what it looks like, what the demand is, we can kind of figure out future funding streams, whether it's from the water offset proposal that we're gonna talk about, whether it's from, you know, part of the rebate program is also a mandate for uh, municipal buildings to upgrade their um, or retrofit their um, low flow fixtures. So that might be able to fund it. But for the first year, we'll just need to fund it through the water department. Um, so we just need to kind of create some application forms, which I'm gonna send over to Jim um, and then do some outreach to residents, let them know that it's, uh, these rebates are available, let them know how to apply for them. And it should be something that um, the water department can run. Um, and um, again, it should be, once it's up and running, should be pretty, pretty seamless. Um, and then we have the offsets. So mm -hmm. I came for you all last June, I believe, and told you kind of where we were. Um, so this is a Word document that you received. At that point, um, the board had approved to continue to work on this policy. It's a, it's a really complicated policy um, that, you know, a handful of towns in Massachusetts um, have implemented. And in all these towns, it has taken quite some time because there's really a lot to consider in order to do it right. Um, so at, as of June, we had recommended a one-to-one -one offset for any um, additional um, uh, usage of water in the water system. So that uh, would be a, an offset fee of $10 per additional gallon of water um, for any project that would have a proposed increase in water use in excess of 1 110 gallons per day. So that equaled about um, so to a, a bedroom if you're adding basically a bedroom. So we had looked at a, um, uh, a chart that showed you know, how many, what the fee would look like for a one bedroom house versus a 50 bedroom or 50 unit development versus a 240 unit development. Um, and talked about the fact that the fees would go into a separate account um, that could only be used to offset water use in our water system, the sustainable water use fund. Again, there's a structure for developing this type of fund that we've seen in other tech cities and towns. The two main items that were outstanding at that time was how to handle commercial entities and how to kind of create a credit system. When I had brought this uh, policy proposal to other committees back in 2017, one of the most consistent comments I received was that people thought that there should be a way to lower your fee if you implement water cons conserving steps in your uh, proposed development. So in that Word document, you'll see we have a structure for um, commercial projects that has a lower fee, um, also allows for, um, you know, places like restaurants, for example, they use a ton of water. Nursing homes use a ton of water. So we're really trying to create a fee structure that would work and wouldn't deter small businesses, but, but would still keep businesses accountable for their water use in town. So we came up with this idea of a, an offset fee of $5 um, as opposed to the $10 per unit um, in the, for the residential program. Um, we would also set a cap for the initial fee and then allow payment of the remaining fee over time. But we haven't set that cap yet. We really need to kind of work with um, developers and local businesses to understand what's affordable, you know, what, what for people to have some skin in the game in terms of their water use, but what is going to allow them to um, thrive in situ. Um, so that's kind of this other big piece that's left that hasn't been completed. Um, we need to figure that out. And then again, understand what that structure might look like. So that would be some work with stakeholders, Nancy Holt, um, and really we want to make sure the fees bring in enough money to fund the projects that we need funded. But again, don't um, deter people from, from starting the businesses here. And then the other piece is this credit system. Um, so where you could implement a number of long-standing measures into your plans that would decrease average water use over time, right? So our, our offset is, tip, is based on this um, EPA or Title V uh, 
assumption of 65 gallons of water per use per day per person. So if you can show that you're implementing things on site to decrease that water use, then we would allow you to decrease the fee. So um, again, we've worked with a bunch of other towns to understand their systems, looked at kind of what makes sense for our town. We've come up with six different items. Um, one is um, the amount of impervious cover you have on your site, natural lawns and landscapes, having an underground cistern or other permanent rainwater capture, a permanent pool cover, um, fixtures that meet or exceed EPA water sense standards, and then also um, implementing gray water reuse on site. But again, this is an area that just needs more time, more resources, more focus. Um, so, you know, after kind of talking it through with Jim, really realizing, you know, it's no longer, and we talked about this in June, you know, it's not really, we need somebody who is um, tapped into the town, um, is an employee consultant who can work with all of the different stakeholders to really flesh out these final items, as well as in figuring out, okay, how does this functionally work once we implement it into the water, into our, our town? We've got to create a special fund. We've got to figure out how exactly to um, allocate funds to different projects. So typically these water offset policies are run by town planners. They're run by water department supervisors. Um, those are typically the, the types of people that the, the um, I can't remember the, the job descriptions that cover this. So it, it, it's no longer, you know, volunteer water resources commission. It's gotta be some people that are kind of working full time in the, in the town. So um, I think my request at this point for, from the select board is we either need to just stop, stop this water offset or we need to put some resources towards um, bringing a consultant or rejiggering some, um, tasks for some employees who currently work in the town. So Jim was gonna kind of look into it and think of that. Jim, I don't know if you're able to figure out what that looks like from a number perspective, um, but it would, you know, we can't, it's kind of got to now be taken out of our hands and moved into an employee's hands to take those last steps. So those are my updates. Okay. Well, um if Jim wants to answer, or if we want to start with the board, does the board have questions? I'm sure there are probably a lot of them. It's a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. um, no, obviously you've been working on it for quite a long time. Um, does anyone, do we want to start with something that's easy? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the, the rebate program might be easier to deal with, or Andrew, you have some thoughts? Yeah. Well, I just more kind of macro. I mean, I, I, I'll start with the rebate program. I mean, just do it again, talking about our the sewer usage and, and doing and never mind water conservation, doing even just the first one, the toilet, the water sends for $100. And then so simple, the aerator, again, talking. And again, thank you, Becky, to your whole uh, committee for all the work you've done on this. Those two alone are so impactful. Um, and I think it's the dividends really pay on, on the water offset policy. I'll give you my position. I, I think at our last meeting with the planning board, Tony said something so insightful. Um, and I loved it. Tony, you said how our greatest fingerprint was, um, the policies that we do. And that really stuck with me. And I think these, um, thinking and, and continuing down this offset policy of how it's both carrots and sticks to help people not only reduce water, but also help these larger commercial businesses reduce. Um, I support for us to continue on that policy search to go on to make sure that there's either someone, a consultant or someone else to kind of carry this forward because I think it's really important. Um, but that's kind of my macro you on it all. So I'll be quiet and people can ask questions. Right. Anyone else? All uh, right. I mean, well, I'll, I'll, yeah, Thank I'll you. just add, you know, Becky, I really applaud the efforts that you and your team are doing on this. It's it's really um it's really a lot of work and it's a lot of directional stuff. And I know I don't always agree with the level of stuff, but conceptually I, I do agree with the movement of, of all of this. I, I want to dive into the details a little bit more in each one of the 
the policies, but I think directionally it's, it's great, you know, and it, it takes a lot of research and a lot of time and a lot of energy to do this that, you know, a group had to dedicate to, and, and I applaud you for doing that. So, um, although I'm not really ready to say yes to, you know, should the fee for a dishwasher be $250, right? Uh, right. I, I definitely agree in the, in the big picture concept of everything we're doing. And I agree with, with uh, Andrew in saying, you know, if we have to hire a consultant for relatively short money to get us over the finish line, then, then I think we should do that. You know, it, it's, it's a big component of what you're doing here. Um, and again, you know, similar to the meeting we had before, a lot of this is, is um, communication. You know, we've got to get this yeah. out to people so that they understand it. You know, this isn't a money grab. You know, we're not trying to inhibit people from developing or inhibit someone from building a three bedroom house because they're going to get hit with some huge water fee associated with it. You know, we've got to kind of get that all across to people that it's really a water conservation and a water education um, initiative as That's opposed something. to, you know, collecting an extra $10 from somebody. So, um, so I'll stop there. So there's really two pieces to the cost. One is to, to get the policy and get it over the finish line, to meet with builders, meet with developers, and try to figure out what works, what doesn't work. Because again, we don't want to put a policy in place that people just say, we're never going to sit you. It's way too complicated. It's way too expensive. Um, I think you're right, Tony. Short dollars, we've been talking to some of our consultants, trying to find out uh, what that could, would cost, try to get that in place. Really, the cost comes in is when you put it in place, this has to reside somewhere with someone who has the knowledge and the ability to say, okay, here's the project. Right. And that Here you go. Yeah, uh, thanks. And that's, that's more of a big question because really it would almost lie with your engineers, but our engineers don't have the bandwidth uh, to do it. One of the things we've talked about with Kevin, um, the sewer department's actually looking at something similar to this. Uh, to come up with an offset program so that we can continue to build and keep capacity in our sewer system. So the, the easy answer is if the sewer department does it and the water department does it, then maybe we can share costs between the sewer and water department, the hiring engineer that can go see this, and eventually, you know, they bring in revenues that will kind of cover themselves. But um, that, that's a much bigger question. That's where we're struggling right now because both of those enterprise accounts um, are not – in financially fantastic shape. You know, we have to raise rates every year to make our, make our numbers. So uh, that's kind of the part that we're working on now to, to get to that point. Um, we'll sit down with Kevin again, we'll try to find out, talk to some of our consultants uh, and get someone that can help us finish putting the policy in place. It's what are we gonna do when we get that policy in place and how are we gonna go forward? How are we gonna pay for that? Uh, because engineering and people are expensive. You figure an engineer, by the time you're all said and done, with benefits and everything is over $100,000. Yeah, and I will say, Jim, I'm glad you mentioned that too. I had kind of skipped or didn't even mention that part that, you know, that credit system that I mentioned for the offsets, um, that takes a lot of work, you know, to, to work directly with developers, understand what they're doing. I mean, some towns will sit with the developers and give them recommendations and help them build it into their plans so they can decrease their water use by a certain amount and hurt, hit a certain fee. Um, some of the people that I spoke to um, in Acton and Abington, um, you know, this is about a third of their job, of their full-time job within the water department or the DPW is managing their water offset program. Um, so if we were to continue and do that credit system, that would be like a half of that third of a, that person's time. Um, so yeah, there is, there is kind of a longer term ask in terms of, you know, is this something that we want to, um, you know, make an important part of our of our of our process of building and it do we um, prioritize um, this idea of putting water back into the system um, and the, and and as a result bring in a longer term resource I have a question it's yes more probably pretty simple so is the intent the intent of all of this and this policy is just for all new initiatives moving forward or are the rebates also available to say, I go out and get a new dishwasher, right? And it's energy efficient. 
is it going to be available to residents in that situation as well? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, it would be geared more toward there would be an outreach that this rebate program is available and you just have to show proof of having purchased a, uh, that item within whatever date, date range we determine and you could get the rebate. Okay. That's great. No, and, and I, mean, I echo right. Tony and, you know, just everyone, Becky, it's such great detailed work, you know, thank you. Um, and how do we, how, you know, how do we get it to the next level here? Um, I had another question, but I need to think for a minute. Um, maybe I can ask Jim, um, does tie and bond, would they have any, you know, um, insight into the types of consultants who could do this work? I mean, we have a um, bunch of different water consultants, so we'll talk to all of them, find out who's done this. Well, I'm just using them capacity. as an example, but yeah, yeah. And, then, and then find out, you know, what, what they would cost us. But yeah. The rebate program should be fairly simple to set up. Um, you know, once we get the forms, we'll put them together. Becky can sign off what they want them to be and put them out. That, I don't think that's going to be a huge uh, burden on the water department that someone comes in and says, I'm here for my reimbursement. I don't expect a thousand people a week to come in and do that. I expect, you know, minimum amount of people over the course of a year to do it. So that that's, we should be able to get that up and running in the next fiscal year. Right? The rebate mm -hmm. program starting out July first. And, and where's the money coming from to provide the rebate? We'd take it out of the water department expense budget, and if we had to, we'd cap it. Uh, you know, put a cap on it. If if it looked really popular, we could always put additional money in. But uh, what we would probably do is just cap cap it at maybe say five ten thousand dollars and see what kind of response we got. We might not even use that. Um, would we restrict it to um, owners of uh, single family residences or? Would we, you know, what if we had Bartlett Field come in and ask for 200 dishwasher rebates? Um, well, that wouldn't be replacements. That would be new stuff. So they'd be under a different, you know, this the, the program is geared towards replacing water heavy usage appliances with water saving appliances. So they wouldn't, I, I would say they don't count because they don't have any appliances. Uh, there would be so more of the offset for, program as opposed to the rebate program. This, so this rebate would just program, be it's, it's geared towards people who homeowners who are saying, "Hey, I got to get a new dishwasher. I'm going to spend an extra whatever it costs to get a super high energy efficient dishwasher," and then the town kicks them back a little bit. Um, which which we would yeah. also have to set that as a standard as well because I I've been buying appliances for a long time now and I, it just seems to me as though everyone's going after that energy star whatever it is. And so um, I think it's actually probably hard to find any dishwasher these days that isn't touting the fact that they use less water. So that's just a picky comment, but. I think there's still yeah. a good amount out there that aren't um, Energy Star qualified. Um, and um, in terms of Jim, maybe that's a good idea to at least restrict it and be clear that we restrict it as uh, to retrofits at least for the first year so that we get a sense of what the demand is and then if we tend to, we have a ton of funding through offsets or through whatever else that we can then fund for new builds but that that might make sense to just be clear though that we're restricting it to just retrofits well and i would add too as part i i remembered what my other question or comment or observation was you know these these the offsets for the new commercial projects some pretty hefty numbers. Um, I think we need to be really clear what the use of those funds are going to be intended for um, in our policy. So it has to be as a, re a requirement of this type of fund that would be created. It's very specific about the types of projects that can be funded, and they can only they are only projects that will put water back into your system. So okay, good. it can't just it can't be for a new operator or it can't be for a new like a new purifier or whatever it's gotta yeah, be no it's gotta yeah. be whether it's conservation whether it's looking for new sources whether it's moving the whole town over to smart meters which is something we're about halfway there this could fund the second half of it whether it's retrofitting municipal buildings um but it, we, we would have to be very specific in the policy document and in the creation of the fund to what those monies can go toward okay perfect and the allocation would need to be made 
by the water department in the first year. It doesn't need to be spent in the first year. Um, well, we found that in some cities and towns, the money just kind of sits in these funds and is never used. So we would require an allocation in that first year so that the projects are completed. And Becky, when you did your research this summer, how many towns are enacting this type of a policy? I know you mentioned like three or four. Are there more than that throughout the Commonwealth? Is this offsets mm. you're referring to? Um, there are more than five, less than 10, I would say off the top of my head. Okay. Um, yeah. And I can I can dig in. I, I've got that all. That, in that's okay. I was just curious if you well, see I, it I, um, I, up of the Ipswich River, which almost ran dry a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a few on the North Shore. We you can see a lot of them, and, and I haven't is on the Cape, which is surprising yeah. to me, um, given theirs. But uh, the Ipswich River is one of the most stressed watersheds in the state. So you start to see them up there. I think we saw three or four up there, Becky. Yeah, and the town of Ipswich is actually working on their own now. Um, their town planner is running it as a result of a town meeting last year, but Abington, Rockland, um, Acton, Danvers, Wenham, those are the uh, ones, maybe Topsfield that are off the top of my head. I'm having a hard time getting my fingers on the document right now. So I have a personal question to ask. Irrigation what? system removal, $2,500. Mm. Now, I... I would gladly remove my irrigation system if you would pay me to do it, um, because frankly, we have not used our irrigation. We haven't right. even turned it on in the past five years, right. because when you want to use it, you can't use it. And when you don't need it, you don't right. need it. I hear that. So if, if someone's willing to pay me $2,500, I'll rip that box right out of the basement <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so that's an interesting one. So they did it in, um, in Hingham. Is it Hingham or Hall? And nobody ever took, nobody ever applied for that rebate. Um, so we put it on there. Jim has some concerns about it as well. I don't know what the water department, with the water department, what the water resources commission had finalized as our list of, of recommendations. Um, but, you know, certainly it can be edited and adjusted. I, you know, I hadn't thought about that piece that how many people in this town don't use their system um, and would be happy to get rid of it. But, you know, we'd have to kind of see, you don't really know what's going to happen until you put these things in place. But that's why that number is so high, I think, because um, yeah. that's the number that they had set it out. And again, I can't remember if it was Hingham or Hall and nobody took advantage of it. Sounds like Hingham. <laughs> anyway. The, the, the numbers are staggering though. Again, like the toilet one again, you go through average family of four, you're talking an average of 16 to 17,000 gallons of water saved by going from an, old, an older one to a new one. So you're talking millions upon millions of gallons saved by just doing that one. It's, cra it's crazy. And you'll see some of those numbers in that data tab. Again, if you got the Excel spreadsheet and not a PDF. Um, you'll see got the PDFs. Yeah, it's a PDF. Okay, I can send over that data to, um, to Lorraine to pass on to you all. Um, that you'll see what some of the savings are and what other towns are implementing those rebates and what they look like. I'd love to see that. Sure. Becky and I had a long conversation about registering the, the irrigation systems. And originally the thought was that you would, you would have to pay to register your irrigation systems. Um, and, and we went around and around on that. And I said to Becky, why would I self-report if I got to write you a check to tell you that right. I have? No, that so, made a lot of sense. Um, we, we took that out and people are going to have to report. And if they don't, uh, then eventually we'll find them. Uh, you, you can't hide. I mean, it's easy to know driving around town with a drought who has irrigation and who's watering. Uh, so eventually we'll find them. And at that point, we can, uh, you know, then it's the stick at that point. But start off with the carrot, try to give people incentives to do this. I'm trying to give them a reason to do it. And then as we get into it, start saying, all right, well, this is not working. We're going to have to go to more, uh, more punitive measures to get people to, to save, uh, save water. So when I register my irrigation system, I can register for the rebate to take it out, right? <laughs> two separate things, two separate programs. <laughs> Possibly the same person, but two different, two different calls. <laughs> two different people, okay. Yeah, potentially. So I don't know if the board has more questions or if we want to open it up to, I see we have some people joining us in the audience um, and what action we want to take tonight. It sounds to me as though it, we've come to a point where we need someone to actually 
implement these things once we approve them. Um, so I don't know what the board wants to do. Or if anyone else wants to chime in, you just have to raise your hand. I don't see any raised hands. So. I suggest that, that we give ourselves a little bit of time to look up at the data and, and to read it and then, you know, maybe even call Becky or go to the committee and, and discuss some of the details of it. Um, and, and then kind of set a reasonable time frame of activating some of this stuff. Yeah, I think that would be great, Tony. I it would, um, cause this has never been like the best forum for this kind of like data dump. And here's all, here's six years of work right. that you can look at and we can talk about in 15 minutes. So, um, you know, that could be an interesting forum to, to do it, to have you guys ask a bunch of questions and we can share it or, or um, and then kind of figure out what needs to happen from there. Well, we're certainly hoping to go back to in-person meetings sooner rather than later, okay. but we didn't want to put you off. I know we've been putting you off, unfortunately, for that. a lot of reasons, but, um, you know, so if, if the board would like, we could get this back on the agenda. Maybe I feel more comfortable in a month Okay. that we would be back in person, I hope. Okay. And none of this will take town meeting action. Jim is laughing at me. I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, oh, back in person. Yeah, yeah, back in person. But none of this is town meeting dependent, right, Jim? No. No. A, rules and regs. All right. Well, I'm, I'm hoping you go back in person soon because sitting in the office after a while, the heat shuts off and it gets cold in here. <laughs> so. Well, you could so, go home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, so we the next Water Resources Commission meeting is Tuesday at 7 p.m. I think we'll most likely be, or Wednesday, I'm sorry, at 7 p.m. I think we'll most likely be virtual still. But if I would invite all of you, if you want to come and chime in um, and ask some questions, that could be great. Um, I don't know. I don't. Are there opportunities for us if there to be meetings separate than this? I mean, I know I, I keep Andrew updated, but you know, you can always call me and ask questions, or shoot me an email, and we can review some of the items. And then maybe Jim, over the next couple of weeks, you could, you and Kevin could look into the cost for consultant. What that might we'll look like. Them to sit down tomorrow and have some conversations about that. We might have to bring you in, Becky, and kind of sure. flesh it out a little bit. But sure, uh, we'll at least we'll at least kick the consultants around the next couple of days to. Right. Tell us what they think they would need to do and what it would cost. At the same time, we'll we'll rope in someone on the saw, uh, saw our yeah. Maybe yeah, think long term. Um, uh, and then maybe we can try to get back on the agenda mid February, um, and have those numbers have a bunch of your questions answered and be able to put this bad boy to bed. All right. Thank you so much to all the, I see a couple of water committee people here and I wanna thank Becky for her uh, intrepid leadership, her <laughs> persistence, okay. perseverance. I know it's been a long road, but you're making real progress. And like I said, I think that everyone needs to understand that this is talking about saving water. Right. And um, so it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Absolutely. Richard Cook. I see your, you've got your hand raised. Richard, gave a thumbs that's up. Martha with a thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> that's different. Okay, I'll learn my icons before this is all over. <laughs> Just in time to go back in person. Just well, I think oh, all... now it's a heart. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martha. Um, well, thank you all for the support and for um, sticking with it as well. Um, so yeah, I look forward to our conversations over the coming weeks and to making some final decisions, hopefully in about a month. So I just have one other question. Is Richard Cook, Martha Cook? Yes, I believe so. See, I'm gonna figure this out sooner or later. All right. Yes, Thank you, everyone. Works. Appreciate it. It's me. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good night. Thanks again for your flexibility. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. All right. So back to my agenda here. Okay, discuss vote, I think that's it. Discuss vote FY23 non-union salary classification plan. Nancy Holt, finance director, town accountant. Nancy. So this one, uh, relatively quick and easy. I, I would assume for the board on this, at your December 21st, 2021 meeting, you uh, adopted a classification plan. 
This is just setting the COLA for the fiscal 23 uh, version of the classification plan. Nothing is changing on the plan. It's just applying a 2% COLA, which is consistent with what was negotiated with the AMP, TOSCA, and laborers unions for fiscal 23. And that way I can build it into the budgets and we'll, we can build it into our payroll program so it'll be seamless come July 1st. Does anyone have any questions, the board? No. Nope. Could I have a motion, please? Poor Morris had to do all the motions tonight. Could someone else take a crack at this? No, I don't mind. Move. Go ahead, Andrew. All right. All right. Move to adopt the FY23 classific classification plan for non union employees with a 2% cost of living adjustment effective from July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. All in favor, roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Four zero, motion carries. Thank you. On to the next discuss vote, increase senior tax write-off work abatement program. Nancy. So the board uh, previously had increased the senior tax work off abatement program, the limit and the hourly rate to match the minimum wage. There was no adjustment in fiscal 21 when the minimum wage changed because they're really due to COVID, there weren't that many um, seniors working in the town hall. Uh, but we would like to make that adjustment for calendar year 2022. The minimum wage right now is $14.25 an hour. So that would be increasing the senior tax workers rate from $12.75 an hour to $14.25 an hour. And it would increase their maximum um, relief that they could get from $1,275 to $1,425. Um, I did check with Joe DeVito from the assessor's office and he said that could be accommodated within the current overlay that we have. Uh, I talked to Linda Hayes and she was on board. She would very much like to see this happen. So I'm putting it before the board to ask you to do that. We did put a cap on the program of 30 participants just so the assessors can plan, but you can change that cap at any time and we're nowhere near that cap right now. I think the most we had was, um, was 21, 21 participants in any given year. Actually, I think the highest was 19 participants. Questions from the board? Motion. This is a really good program and we would encourage people to take advantage of it. It's a nice way to reduce your property taxes. Do I hear a motion? Move to. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Tony. I didn't have stepping on your toes. Sorry. Tony can do it. <laughs> uh, move to increase the annual limit for the senior tax work off abatement program to $1,425, increase the hourly rate to $14.25, and set the number of participants to a maximum of 30. Second. 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 Se second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. And I see uh, David Cedroni from WATD News has, I believe that's his hand raised. Correct? Yes, you are correct. And Mr. Cedroni you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, uh, Mr. Hi everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's, I think it's an interesting story. I'm just wondering, the seniors that don't know what they would be doing, can you just uh, describe some of the jobs that some of these uh, people that would sign up for the program, what they would be doing, what they did last year, and what um, and how to sign up, and like uh, again, like what kind of jobs are they? Thank you. Um, so the program is run through the Council on Aging Director, Linda Hayes, so they would want to uh, reach out to her. Um, and then she reaches out to all the departments and asks if there's any available um, work to be done. So it runs the gamut. We've had people that uh, work on selling beach stickers and tra transfer station stickers at the height of the season, um, doing all the, the mail-ins and online. Uh, also, the uh, Lorraine and the Select Board's office has had a number of uh, senior tax work off participants that have helped do uh, organize the board and committee book, and, um, organize minutes, do any number of uh, different research projects. So uh, I think the Select Board's office has been one of the um, uh, principal users of the program. A great program that it is. And it's a nice atmosphere to work in. Yes. 
Anyone else? Thank you, Dave. All right. Thumbs up versus hand up. Okay. So uh, next on our agenda is the discuss vote drain layers licenses. There are three. Do I hear a motion? Move the renewed uh, renewal of drain layers licenses for Riccio Excavation, for Jones Con Contracting Incorporated, and for the Ringler Excavating Corporation. Second. Second. Second, Second by Mr. Goodrich. Motion. Uh, I'm sorry. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Okay, motion carries 4 0. Discuss vote new drain layer license for BNV Enterprises doing business as Rooter Man. So moved. Moved by Mr. Vignani. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Uh, discuss vote 2022 seasonal population estimate. Move Nancy, Jim, who wants to explain this? Why we do this? No explanation. This is for the ABCC, the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you, have a, an annual report that we provide to them. And the number that is on here is a number we've been using for many years. No changes. All right. So uh, my, my recollection of is like 28,000, including- 28,500, I think is the, is the recommendation. All right. So I think there's a motion somewhere. Move to approve the 2020 seasonal population estimate as of July 10th, 2020, our resident population estimate is 28,500 citizens. Second. I just, I'll just i second with an amendment, it's 2022, not 2020. Oh, I'm sorry, thanks. Yeah, it's just- retro It's retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So second. Second by Ms. Curran. Motion, uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Four I zero can't read any more either, Tony, so. <laughs> four, four zero motion carries, thank you. Other business, liaison reports, anyone have anything? Mm -hmm. Andrew, you don't have to answer for the Water Resources Committee. Yes. They just did a great job. I do have one other business. Yes. Um, I uh, was in touch with someone from the dog park committee and they are uh, trying to advance the project to make that other park in the back for uh, smaller dogs. And they just, uh, they're gonna be bringing that to CPC um, for funding, for some funding. They have other funding from another source um, and they wanted to get um, a letter from the board of selectmen supporting the project. So me being the least dog uh, person on the, on the board that do support the project. Go ahead, uh, say the word friendly, Tony. Friendly, I like dogs, I just don't. Want one. I'm, I'm allergic to them. Um, um, so I just wanted to, if the, if the board agreed, um, then I just asked Lorraine to write a, a letter and send it over to Dan for our support of the, uh, yeah. really it's the finishing of that project. It's been, that's what it was proposed all along and they did the bigger park and they want to finish up on the smaller part. I received the same request, so I'll support you with that as well. But I, I did ask to see um, where the second piece of it goes because the right. drawing didn't make sense to me. So I just wanted to double check that. Yeah, we asked about the increase in parking because there really isn't any room for more parking. I mean, generally speaking, I'm in favor of it, but you know. Yeah, well, we'll, vo we'll vote the project, you know, when it comes before us. In terms they just of want our conceptual, so conceptually, we, for, and this Endorse is for CPC. Yeah. yeah. The, the plan, as I understand it, has been approved already. The, the plan for the big dog park and the small dog park has already been approved by the planning board. They I just thought didn't have it the funding was. to build yeah. the small dog park. So I can get a copy of the plan, send it out to the board. 
Um, but the plans have been approved. They're looking for funding at this point to build it. They don't have the money to do it. Well, I and, think and the thought is it's not going to really increase uh, it's just gonna the number separate of dog owners down. It's going to separate the big dogs and the small dogs. Yeah. Well, uh, if I could say, as much as I understand why they want the board to write a letter, it hasn't been the board's habit to weigh in prior to CPC voting on applications. Well, then maybe they misunderstand because I, it was my understanding that CPC asked them to obtain such a letter from us. I think CPC usually get asked them to obtain it from things like the recreation department, the other departments in town. Uh, it would be the first time in my memory that the select board weighed in in favor of something in advance. I think it's more support of the concept. And again, we can vote however we want when the, when the actual CPC article comes before us, whether we like the plan or we don't like the plan. But I think, I think what the request is, and more correct me if I'm wrong, is just support on the completion of the project that was proposed, probably that was probably three or four or five years ago. That's what my request indicated, yeah. Yeah. All right, I doesn't matter to me if the board wants to, I'm, do I hear a motion to send I a letter? That we, uh, that we draft a letter to support the completion of the dog park project. Second. Second by Ms. Curran, all in favor. This is a liaison report. It's turned into oh. a motion now. You're right, you're right. It's actually not, it's just asking Lorraine just to, write to write a letter. I'll draft a letter, I'll send it out to the board. Great. All right. Any other liaison reports? No. No. DEI meeting got moved to tomorrow night if anybody wants to join. All right. And we still owe them a response to their um, the statement that they would like the select board to yeah. uh, to to read before every meeting and whatever the select board would like to direct all the other boards and committees in town to in town to do if we do want to direct any of the other boards and committees in town. Would you want me to add that to the next agenda? I was going to say, yeah. Uh, yes, please. That? Yep. That'd be good. I'll resend it out to everybody for your comments prior Thank to you. the meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Correspondence, Mr. Goodrich. I will be terse. An additional uh, $72,000 and change um, from the CARES Fund was approved. Again, Nancy, thank you for wonderful work uh, getting that done, which is fabulous. Um, also, the, the, the absolute total now for Plymouth CARES is now 2.9 million. Is that? Yes, 2.9 million, which is fabulous. Also, the Plymouth County Mosquito Control Project uh, has a whole, I spent way too much time researching these different types of mosquitoes that are actually here. Biggest advice I would say from looking at this, if you have an Don't old tire, <laughs> throw away old tires. They apparently oh. keep mosquitoes and breed them and there's different types and it's disgusting, but <laughs> there's, they visited the Plymouth County Mosquito came to over 800 sites last year, which is amazing to help kill some of those mosquitoes for West Nile and other stuff. Anyway, um, so that was that the correspondence. So thank you for that, it was wonderful. And also we got a letter from the local uh, election division uh, approving and considering the submission of our precincts, which I think is a formality, but it's wonderful that there was nothing a miss. No problems. So thanks, thanks to Kathy Gardner. Yes, that's all. Yes. I have. So, uh, approval of meeting minutes. Do I hear a motion? Um, let me get the date. January fourth. Move to approve the meeting minutes from the select board meeting held on January fourth, twenty twenty-two. Second. Okay. Second. Second by Mr. Vignani. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 4-0.
So Lorraine, do we, before we adjourn, do you need us to come in and sign, sign documents tomorrow? Uh, you know, I, the only thing I really have in there is, uh, I don't have a lot. So if you can come in any time this week, it doesn't have to be okay. tomorrow, but any time this week, I have nothing urgent right now. Well, and before we adjourn, I would like to thank the planning board for our joint meeting last week. And thanks Sherry Moke Young, I believe is her full name, uh, for, uh, she actually had a signing documents, Lorraine. She was very nice. Yes, I sent them in with her. Yep. Yep. It was very efficient. <laughs> I figured why make another trip for you down here, right? We, we certainly appreciated it. And yeah. uh, she was doing the minutes. So, um, but it was a very productive meeting of the planning board and the uh, select board to talk about the implementation <clears> of the master plan. And we thank them all for their participation. And with and that- the, And those minutes will be ready at the next meeting. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. do, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Don't everyone jump up and down. Thank you, Tony. Seconded by Mr. Vignani. All in favor, roll, roll call vote. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Good night, everyone. And thank you, Seth. And thank you, Jim and Nancy and everyone else who participated tonight. Have a good, good night. night.